Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody to our Blockchain for Climate webinar. Um, it will be an exciting afternoon here today where we will touch upon a number of distinct issues uh, for around the blockchain technology as a solution for some of our pressing climate issues. Um, the webinar today is organized by UNIP DTU, uh, which is a collaborating center between the Danish Technical University and UN Environment and the Technical University of Berlin. And we are proud that we run this webinar in collaboration and with contributions from Blockchain for Climate, Block, the World Bank, and UNFCCC. Um, the presenters of today's webinar will be Marco Schletz, who is a PhD student here at UNIP DTU Partnership. Uh, then Laura Franke, who is a master's student at TU Berlin, a just finished master's student, uh, presenting some of her research. Then Joseph Pallant from the Blockchain for Climate Foundation, uh, who will, based on the two previous presentations, then show a um, well-developed first idea of how to actually implement a blockchain solution to the um, uh, Paris Agreement Article 6 uh, challenges, you could say. Then we have Mark Johnson, technical project manager from Block, presenting. Uh, and then we have two uh, from the World Bank group, uh, Rachel Mark and uh, Susan Paravik, who will present jointly. And finally, Masamba uh, Toi from the UNFCCC, who will wrap up with the presentation for today. Uh, after that, we invite for a discussion. Uh, and uh, please uh, feel free to comment throughout the presentations. We will if there is time, go back to some of your comments and in particular your questions and, and try to discuss those uh, amongst those who present. Um, so with that, uh, I wish you um, all the best for this uh, webinar and uh, let's have an interesting insight into how blockchain can address uh, or present solutions to some of our pressing climate, challenge, uh, climate change challenges. Hello and welcome everyone, also from me. Um, I'm also located in Copenhagen, so we will change seats here. Um, in an ongoing fashion between the presenters. My name is Marco Schlitz and I'm a PhD student at the UNEP DTU Partnership. Just to give you a bit of background on the UNEP DTU Partnership, it's a three-party agreement between the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, between the Technical University of Denmark and between the UN Environment Program. And it was established in 1990. Um, we are operating in over 50 developing countries with a staff count of over 70 economists and scientists. And this PhD position is a very interesting opportunity for me because it allowed me to merge my two passions. Um, the, the climate passion uh, that I've been following for three years with the Unity 2 partnership before, and it has been merged with my passion on blockchain. Um, which I started developing in 2013 when I discovered this funny internet money um, uh, that's called Bitcoin. And then in 2015, when Ethereum entered the picture and the whole range of interesting potential use cases was, was more and more unveiling, I started actively following the, um, the space. So that's a bit of background on me. Um, I'd like to start off um, with a slide that illustrates why I think it's absolutely important that we are looking at blockchain already now. It's often criticized and presented in the mainstream media as an infant technology with a lot of uncertainty and limitations. Um, and there has been also a recent hype bubble um, that didn't really help improving the reputation of blockchain. But I think it's still very crucial to look at blockchain already now when, you, when we are discussing future systems. Um, on the left-hand side um, of the presentation, I have an um, a diagram that is illustrating the adoption rates of, uh, of emerging technologies. And in the beginning of the 1900s, like with, for example, the car and the telephone, it took a long time, sometimes almost 50 years, until we reached like a, an adoption rate of 50% of this technology. But the further right we move um, in terms of the technologies, the faster the adoption rates are accelerating. And especially if we're looking since the inception of the internet, um, technology rates uh, were, are just basically going um, vertical. Um, so if we look, for example, at the tablet and the smartphone, it took a few years only until basically everyone used them and until they had a, a really 
influential impact on our society. I mean, imagine in a world without the internet now. Um, and uh, until and that didn't take a long time actually. I remember the days when I didn't really have a smartphone, but it, it and and now it's it, it's my everyday work. Um, I don't know if blockchain will take the exact same tra trajectory, but it, there is definitely potential and the promise of this technology having a similar in impact. So when we are talking about post 2020 systems, like for example the carbon uh, market designed by the, or stated in the Paris Agreement. We absolutely have to look at, at um, new systems that can be applied towards this challenge in order to uh, avoid the risk of a system login. Um, what I mean with a system login is that we are just settling on conventional systems that have maybe proven itself over a long time, but um, that, that are not really up um, or that, that pose the risk of when they are um, used in the future that they might be technology logged technologically um, outdated already when they are um, uh, entering the, the picture. Um, and so it is something that we have to consider um, with the rapid developments going on in the blockchain space. There's a lot of money and talent flowing into this space and a lot of the challenges are already addressed or about to be addressed. Um, we also have to consider that blockchain um, is really benefiting and beneficial for other evolving technologies, like, for example, the Internet of Things um, or machine learning, where an interoperability really accelerates the adoption and um, the impact of, of, of both thing or of all technologies involved. Um, so getting back to uh, getting more blockchain specific again, um, I'm often confronted with uh, when I'm um, presenting my professional profile. Um, I'm, I'm telling that I'm a climate scientist that is working with blockchains, and this is often seen to be a contradiction, um, uh, because I get the re uh, the reaction that oh, climate and blockchain, um, blockchain consumes so much energy that doesn't really make sense. Why are you doing that? And that uh, provides the point that a blockchain is very often seen as as a uniform term, not as a diverse group of technologies, which is uh, important to see it as. Since, um, since the inception of uh, Bitcoin, um, blockchain has developed dramatically, but the understanding of blockchain is often still related to the Bitcoin blockchain and the scalability issues that Bitcoin has and the high energy consumption. Um, and there is also a struggle in the blockchain space still ongoing um, that blockchain is not often developed for a specific problem. Um, luckily, we have two initiatives um, today presenting on the webinar that are actually taking this um, use case angle and then this and select a blockchain solution and design a blockchain solution based on this use case but this is something that has been neglected in the space and um, led to a very low adoption rate so far by the technology based on especially compared to the high expectations it has um, so in order to illustrate um, that blockchain is not a uniform term and that it needs to be use case driven um, I, I want to uh, use three examples from the from the climate area and uh, elaborate more on this during the rest of the presentation. So um, when we are talking about blockchain, it is important to understand that there is not one blockchain that can resolve all of our issues, but that there is always a trade-off between components of the blockchain. So a blockchain can never optimize for security, scalability, and decentralization at the same time but it's a trade-off between the three elements. When I'm speaking about security, it's basically the resilience of the system against malicious attacks and also the resilience of the ledger in itself so that data entries cannot easily be manipulated by an authority or a malicious actor. When I'm speaking about scalability, I'm speaking about the network performance, which is measured in users and the transaction throughput. Um, and which is often still um, described as a major struggle also in the mainstream media. Um, and there are a lot of um, initiatives going on and a lot of approaches um, applied towards resolving the scaling issues that are currently experienced by the systems. And as a third trade-off element, um, it's decentralization, which is basically um, the user access uh, to the system. So. Um, a decentralized system is a system like Bitcoin where everyone can install the software and participate in the network via transactions, but also as a validator. So I can install my 
my software and can transact without any hustle, without any central authority having to authorize or verify my user status. So there is no censorship of information and there is a total accessibility for every user. Um, in order to develop this blockchain trilemma a little bit further, um, this has led to the development of different blockchain types. So on the one hand side, um, as I said, it's the, the decentralization aspect, which um, in this um, slide is the, uh, the, the horizontal axis uh, and is described in public and private. So a public network has, as I said, open access to everyone and there is no uh, uh, no, no um, authority that can censor who has or decide who has access to the network. And um, also the data access for everyone is, is free. Um, so everyone can, can look at the entire data stream, like for example, with the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Um, when I'm speaking about this diagram, it is important that it is understood as a scale. So it is always a, um, a, a gray gradient and not like black and white. It's not either or, but it is always on a scale to understand uh, decentralization and then also the permissionless and permission system. Um, so if we continue with the blockchain, uh, with the Bitcoin example, uh, Bitcoin is beside being public, as I described it before, it's a permissionless system, meaning that there is no central authority that rules over the network, but a consensus mechanism, um, which is called proof of work in this case, um, meaning that everyone can install the software and participate in the network with transactions as well as also governance questions. Uh, in contrast, um, we have more permission system, like for example EOS, um, which, is, um, uh, which, is, which is accessible by every user, but um, it is permission in a way that there is only a um, certain number of nodes that can validate the network transactions. And um, these nodes are dis decided upon by a governance authority. So um, it, this go governance authority has a theoretical uh, ability to censor net network transactions and also who can contribute to the network as a as a validator node and then there are examples like for example hyperledger fabric which is known from the corporate application mainly which is private meaning that it is owned by a either a corporation in itself or a consortium of corporations so a number of entities that together have authority over the network and it is um, so that is why it is permissioned and um, it is private because the data access by the public is not there. So I, as an individual, don't have access to, to look at the transaction and get the data access. So now I'll illustrate these kind of different blockchain types with climate examples. Um, the first example um, which I want to apply is the carbon market example. And by carbon market, I mean um, that blockchain can, can be used as a platform for trading of mitigation outcomes and specifically uh, more in the Paris Agreement and Article 6 context, which will be further elaborated by, by the next presentation. So I won't go into too much detail, but I still want to present it as, a, as an example in order to contrast it with the other two use cases. So the Paris Agreement has this ethos that it is bottom up and transparent, meaning that it should be accessible by basically everyone in the system. Um, yeah, so it is in a way it is decentralized, but the access is still permissioned because it is only parties um, like the parties or countries that have signed the Paris Agreement can contribute to the network in, in form of transactions in terms of um, providing tradable emission outcomes. Um, and then also other authorities like, for example, technical expert groups or U the UNFCCC, for example, that will also have access to this network. But it's not that an individual can really participate in the, in the network itself. Um, then it is a, um, yeah, a system that is only known for, um, yeah, only for known actors, so it is a permission system. So that is why I located um, the blockchain that should be used for this use case. Um, in the uh, between uh, maximizing for for C in the triangle, um, meaning that security and decentralization are the focus, but scalability is not too important because the transaction throughput uh, throughput won't be um, too high um, based on historical experience as well. The next example I want to present is um, the climate finance application of blockchain, 
meaning that um, blockchain can be used as a um, vehicle to, to to secure funding for green projects like renewable energy or energy efficiency projects um, through, for example, crowdfunding, where retail investors all over the world can pool money and um, receive a fractional ownership of um, of an asset like a wind farm or solar panels. Um, blockchain can be applied to this use case because it promises efficiency gains in terms of transaction costs reduced. So um, even for a global transfer, the transaction costs are comparably low uh, if you compare it to a conventional bank transfer, for example. So uh, it can um, uh, be used by a global user base for that. And then it can be also used for, for data exchanges, um, meaning that um, uh, when um, yeah, transactions um, like payments and repayments. Uh, the blockchain can be used um, to conduct result-based finance, meaning that only um, if a certain uh, milestone, for example, by the project developer, by the host of the solar panel um, is achieved, the next tranche of money will be dispersed to it or it can be also earmarked towards a specific use case, for example, the purchase of um, equipment for, for a solar panel farm. So it cannot just be disappearing somewhere or um, there might be also be required a receipt in order to unlock the next amount of payments. And then also in return, um, the, the funders of the project cannot only specify what their funds are used for, but they can also automate that there are re, uh, repayments made by, by the project developer. So, so for example, if I have a project that um, creates a lot of ener energy, electricity, and that is sold, um, I can already program on the blockchain that these repayments are made in micropayments um, automatically so that there is also no money leaving the system without me knowing. And um, that leads to a, a higher security for me as an investor. Um, in this case, the blockchain design is required to be secure. But um, in, in, as a difference towards um, the carbon market example, it needs to be more scalable because the transaction throughput is just a lot higher and also the data flow will be, will be bigger um, through the smart contracts. The access to the system needs to be permissioned, um, meaning that only the project developer and then the, the, the potential funders have access to, uh, to the network and can provide transactions and also um, yeah, be, be part of the system. And then the individual transactions between the, um, between the project lead, uh, b between the project developer and the funder should be on a, on a private basis because as I, as a, as a funder, for example, don't have any interest that my investment is made public. As a third use case, um, I would like to present the clean energy use case, which is maybe the most uh, Prom prominent use case at the moment um, of blockchain in the clean energy in the in a um, climate space at all. There are already some projects that are that are having um, implemented su successful uh, pilots. So there is already something happening, and blockchain can be used then as a platform to automate um, peer-to-peer energy trading. So um, I, as a solar panel owner in a country, I have access of any electricity and I would like to to sell this electricity to my neighbor and this is currently not really feasible in a lot of countries and it's also often blocked by utilities or by other systems and blockchain can be used as a platform to circumvent that and automate these transaction flows um, and this is possible through the integration of sensors like smart meters for example that measure the electricity that I contributed to the to the um, network and then I will reimburse automatically with monetary uh, payment transactions. And for the system itself, um, the access should be open, meaning that everyone who has a solar panel can actually, or, or a wind turbine or whatever other energy form um, you would like to have in the network, that everyone can just freely join without needing to be like verified or um, yeah, verified by, a, by an authority of the network. So in this case, the blockchain application should, should be scalable um, because there is, again, a quite high transaction throughput, especially if you look also at the sensor data and then of all the payments made back and forth, which will often be micropayments. So it's important that the system is scalable. It needs to be decentral, as I said, with an open access for every interested actor. Um, and the transaction should, again, be, be more private because I, as, a, um, as an actor in the network, 
would like to um, not have the full disclosure of my contribution to the network and the monetary flows towards me. So to summarize that, um, blockchain is not a uniform term. It shouldn't be used as, um, as one single uniform term, but it, it is um, a diverse group of technologies with different weaknesses and strengths. And that is why it is important to understand the use case, to understand the requirements of the use case, and then use and apply a, a specific blockchain towards it that is most suitable. Um, for this, a lot of technical analysis and research is still needed because we, we have quite limited um, examples of this and we need to have more real, real world applications of it in order to understand the systems better, refine the technology and make it more, adopt, uh, more adaptable for our situation. Um, and it is a very iterative process where there needs to be feedback between the, for example, the project developers in the climate space and then also the blockchain programmers. Um, I, I would like to finish off my presentation by stating that I don't necessarily see blockchain as the silver bullet that will solve all our problems in the climate space, but uh, rather an interesting tool that is very important to consider right now in the system design choices that we're making in order to not miss out on, on opportunities and to be also able in the future to justify our choices um, that we're currently making and also be aware of the of the trade-offs and choices that that will and, and the effects that it might have so with that i would like to thank you and um, hand over to laura with the next presentation hello everybody thanks for having me sorry for that like as always too many emails and sometimes the new presentations just lost when you really need it so uh first of all let me present myself this is uh, so no, first of all, sorry if I'm not looking the whole time in the camera, but um, I see myself here and I will have from time to time look on my presentation. So I'm not trying to ignore you. <laughs> so first, perhaps to me. So I'm Laura Franke. I'm a master student at the TU Berlin and um, I studied now industrial engineering and management with a major in computer science. And during my master thesis, I came in contact with Mako from before and had the opportunity to write my master thesis about blockchain. And he's now. So, and um, I had the possibility to uh, write my master thesis about possibilities of the blockchain for the carbon market, specifically Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. So, perhaps, um, first of all, I was interested in blockchain, or I'm interested in the technology of blockchain since 2015, so quite a while now, um, and I'm mainly searching for possibilities to apply this um, technology because as Marco said earlier, it's probably not the um, silver bullet for all our problems, but for some of them it might help us to improve our existing systems. So um, first for the presentation, uh, why blockchain, why carbon markets, why Article 6.2? Um, in my opinion, a blockchain might be a really cool solution to interlink the activities of participating parties under the Paris Agreement and give the opportunity to actually increase our mitigation um, activities and also to have a better record what, of what is actually happening um, during the implementation of projects. Then also why Article 6.2, you might ask. So um, Article 6.2 is the most bottom-up article in the Paris Agreement. So it was um, great as a first analysis and first development of a model to actually see if blockchain might be a solution for the Paris Agreement or not. So uh, with this, I hope you have a good uh, overview of why I did this. Um, this is not my whole master thesis. Unfortunately, I just had 20 minutes or just have 20 minutes. Um, but I hope uh, or I'm really happy to answer your questions. So just feel free to ask some in the chat option. So um, first of all, when you think about applying a new technology, a new system, you have to think about, well, what are the current problems of the existing system? And for this, I had um, a look at the Kyoto Protocol um, 
I'm sorry, at the Kyoto Protocol and the lessons learned under the Kyoto Protocol and develop um, some aspects which the system might fulfill, might help to improve. So for example, information asymmetry. So when we talk about the selling certificates, the selling party might have more information about the unit quality than the buying party. So here might be a possibility for the blockchain to tackle this problem and even erase this problem or um, for example have the possibility to increase transparency or um, or to uh, lower transaction costs so this was um, my first starting point and based on this I then had a look at article 6.2 so um, unfortunately we do not have a final version of the governmental model and how article 6.2 in practice in practice will look like but I based my assumptions upon the presidential proposal of COP24 and in this it stated that um, we can generate and exchange ITMOs to fulfill NDC targets on uh, national targets um, and these ITMOs can be measured in CO2 tons uh, or another uh, metric depending on what the participating party uh, has as a target in their NDCs but uh, let's just stick for this to CO2 as it's easier um, and then unfortunately what wasn't mentioned but probably also because of this bottom-up uh, structure of article 6.2 is who's actually responsible in issuing the ITMOs at the end of the project development so my assumption for this is um, that the participating parties will be responsible for the assurance of the ITMOs uh, on the right hand side you can see an overview of the parties and where they are allocated in the Paris Agreement. So we have Article 6.2 with the Secretariat and the participating parties and as you can see the participating parties are reporting to the Secretariat and um, to ensure the quality of the project um, the technical experts shall be included but they shall um, act under the transparency articles so article 13 so here we, again we can see this need to create more transparency and perhaps the need for a blockchain solution so then now let's come to the interesting part to actually develop a blockchain solution and find out if it's suitable for this use case and for this um, my first step was to develop a decision tree and have a, to get a first insight if a blockchain solution and if so which type of blockchain is actually applicable uh, or the most suited for article 6.2 then in the next step I use the lessons learned displayed earlier to um, distinguish if blockchain is actually um, can actually help to improve the current situation because you might ask you might think well why should we change this if it doesn't give us a new benefit so um, I think it's important to state on the already existing um, problems and look like how the system can actually help here and then point three, it's about the tech, technical components. So for example, the amount of, partici uh, of participating parties, there are several hundred countries involved. So how, how can we represent them upon the blockchain? Is it possible upon each blockchain or do we have to, um, are there several blockchain solutions which aren't possible to handle this amount of transaction throughput, for example? And then last not, but not least, in my opinion, often a factor which is not included in analysis are the soft factors. So on the soft factors, I understand, for example, the community behind this blockchain solution. Um, if we have, for example, look at Ethereum, one of the biggest blockchain um, systems, which is a public um, and permissionless system, um, it's... Um, we it's often not included how the community might react on um, on a still political use case. So uh, in the fourth part, I analyzed these aspects. Uh, for this presentation, though, I mainly will focus on point one and three and present these to you and not have a deeper look on point two and four. But if you have questions here, do not hesitate to ask. So. 
welcome and let's see my lovely decision tree. So as you can see, there are 10 questions and I already filled it out for the use case. And um, these are basically yes and no questions um, to, um, to quickly have an overview and get an answer at the beginning of a pro um, project. So even for you, if you're here from um, with not an energy background and just want to have an insight if blockchain might be suitable for you, um, these are really important questions you have to ask yourself first and to get the first idea if blockchain might be um, applicable to your use case. So I would just high, um, point out some questions which are my opinion really important also for this use case. So first of all, we have to ask, this is why it's the first question, if there are multiple actors involved. So basically a blockchain solution is not, um, it doesn't work if you just have two people active upon it. So you need a network of multiple actors which then need an asset to exchange. So again, you need somehow data and, um, or in the case, for example, of Bitcoin money, which you can exchange and then also um, the system to be able to give it, to um, have its own full functionality. Um, so these are the first two questions. If you do not have that, then I think Sorry, but you, a, a blockchain isn't a possible for, a solution for you. In the case of Article 6.2, it is uh, it is given. Um, for example, if you remember before, we have the secretariat, we have the participating parties, and we have the technical advisors um, reviewing the reviews. So um, we have this network, and as an asset, we can, uh, could imagine ITMOs um, with the currency in CO2 emissions just as a first idea. Then um, let's jump to question five, which is about if you intend to store a large amount of files, um, uh, like pictures or videos. So blockchain, because it's so distributed and everybody has a copy of the ledger, is not suitable currently. I mean, there are some, um, some startups, for example, trying to find solutions in these fields, but it's currently not suitable to store large um, files. So in the case of Article 6.2, we mainly have alphanumeric files or data, so which can, um, can be easily handled by a distributed system, which do not take so much storage. Um, so here we do not have a bottleneck. Um, then um, let's further jump to to question eight, which is about the need of a system which is immune against fraud by network participants. So uh, here it's about do you actually need a consensus protocol, which is one of the main attributes of a blockchain solution. And first of all, I do not think or I hope nobody of the countries or the participants of Article 6.2 intend on doing fraudulent work, but you never know and there might be even actors outside trying to attack the system, trying for example to get a token representing the asset. So here we still have the need to have a consensus uh, protocol protecting the whole system, protecting um, even um, and protecting their assets to be double counted or double spent. And then question nine and ten are basically already to get like um, these are the final two questions. So when you reach here, you are on a good way to actually implement a blockchain later on. And these questions are about which type of blockchain is the most suitable for you. So for example, if you um, so we have heard earlier about private and public blockchains or permissioned or permissionless blockchain solutions. So if you want a, um, a block blockchain solution which is close, where you can control you or um, other companies, other players who has access to the network, then for you a permissioned and private blockchain is the most suitable. But if you say, well, you want to have control over the consensus protocol, so who is actually able to validate transactions and create blocks, um, but um, everybody should be able to access the network and participate on it, then a permissioned and public blockchain solution is good for you. And then it's it's rarely, unfortunately, the case, but if you are so open that you say everybody shall access it and um, regardless if it's the consensus protocol 
or I'm just handling the transactions and having access to the data, then you have like the green um, bucket. <laughs> it's a permissionless and public blockchain solution. And in my opinion, in the use case of Article 6.2, it will be either a totally closed system because of its political nature, so a permissioned and private blockchain, or a slightly open blockchain, meaning uh, a permissioned um, blockchain, but which is open public to all, mm, to the whole world, basically. Everybody has a computer. So this as a first idea where we are standing, where we put our focus on for the next blockchains. And for this, in my master theaters, I uh, analyzed four different blockchains. So I had to look at Ethereum, Stellar, Hyperledger, Fabric, and EOS. Um, but for this presentation, I would just compare Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric um, to have also later on an easier discussion. And as there are, in my opinion, a good representation of a public and private system uh, and their um, advantage, but also disadvantages, as we will soon see. So um, these are now on this slide, uh, which you can see technical aspects. So in the case of Ethereum, um, we have generally a, a, a high scalability. You, ca you cannot forget um, that Ethereum is one of the largest blockchains out there. It's, uh, it has a huge community. So saying that it's not scalable at all, meaning that it cannot handle a large amount of participants, um, wouldn't. Um, wouldn't just be true. So, but why is it now a medium scalability? The problem is here, as you might know, or as some of you might know, at the current status with proof of work, um, it is not able to handle multiple transactions in a second. So here at the top, at the transaction rate, you can see that it ca um, that it cannot handle uh, 30, um, 36 transactions per second, which is a number I calculated myself, which, um, which the blockchain solution should be capable for Article 6.2. Um, so this is definitely a bottleneck for Ethereum. On the other hand, Hyperledger Fabric, which is a permissioned and private blockchain solution, it has uh, medium scalability, not as you can see because of the transaction rate where you have over 3,000 tra possible transactions per second, but um, the problem is that the consensus protocol cannot handle too many validators at the same time. Um, now you could argue, well, it's a private permission system, but it's still something you have to keep in mind when choosing this um, hyperledger fabric or cho not choosing hyperledger fabric. And then, as you can see, regarding decentralization, um, Ethereum is high because everybody can openly uh, just can just join it regardless of the system and the validation um, protocol. But in the case of Hyperledger Fabric, you actually have to be invited to participate or you have to create an account so they are able to track who's upon the network. So regarding anonymity, it's just zero. Um, so this can be doesn't have to be, depending on your use case, a downside. Um, so, and let's just have a last look on this slide uh, on asset representation. So, um, the asset in the case of Article 6.2 can be, which uh, would be an ITMO, could be a fungible or non-fungible token, meaning a, uh, a fungible token is one which you can easily exchange. It's basically money, so you can you can halve it. It always has the same currency. It's basically euro dollars, or in the case, per, as an example of um, of a blockchain Bitcoin. Uh, a non-fungible token is one uh, which you cannot divide. So some of you might have heard of CryptoKitties. If not, stay tuned. You, will, uh, you might get some. Um, but it's something which has a unique value. It's often also compared to a baseball card and um, which just stays, uh, which will have a value depending on the request, uh, the demand upon the network. So now the last two slides, nearly done on my side, um, which are about the advantages and disadvantages for the use case Article 6.2 to either adopt Ethereum or Hyperledger Fabric. So um, 
in the case of Ethereum, uh, definitely an advantage is that it, it um, supports the participation of external actors. So, um, for example, a blockchain foundation which could be able to support UNF2C developing the system or other actors which uh, just want to participate in um, improving the climate. And so this is definitely an advantage of Ethereum, which Hyperledger Fabric doesn't have. And here you can, um, but an advantage which Hyperledger Fabric has is that it has no transaction fees. This basically comes due, uh, or this is basically due to its close in nature. And last perhaps which is really interesting is that ethereum has these um a new token standard where it would be possible to combine fungible and non-fungible tokens later on uh in one so perhaps if you're interested in that you definitely should have a look uh, as a disadvantage for ethereum is that it has quite high transaction fees um, um, with the highest which actually also comes um, due to the fact that it still has proof of work so it's envisioned to adopt proof of stake it's not there yet unfortunately so this might change um but at the current point this could be a bottleneck uh to for uh, article 6.2 or in general for the paris agreement Furthermore, it's questionable how upon Ethereum you want to ensure data security for Article 6.2 as all the validating nodes, which are um, actors you might not know, have a copy of the whole history as well upon the blockchain. So if this is really important for the participating parties, um, this might be a problem. Um, on the other hand, Hyperledger Fabric, as you might think, has the huge problem that um, as it's closed, it has to, um, it has no open access for external actors to participate upon the network itself. Um, so if this is demanded to support the spot and up structure of Article 6.2 or the Paris Agreement, this, um, this is definitely uh, um, not possible under Hyperledger Fabric. Um, furthermore, with Hyperledger Fabric is that because it's closed and because you don't have this external support, you kind of depend upon the Linux Foundation. So Hyperledger Fabric is a product under the Linux Foundation. And if um, you're an FCCC, do not have an in-house um, technic department which can um, publicate updates for Hyperledger Fabric, it will stay upon the status you have currently or with new status of the Linux Foundation. So with this, thank you a lot for your attention and let's hear about external actors participating upon the blockchain. Hello and good day everyone. This is Joseph Palance from the Blockchain for Climate Foundation. And I'm going to walk you through a presentation about the work that we are doing to put the Paris Agreement on the blockchain, connecting the national carbon accounts of all the countries of the world to enable cross-border collaboration and investment in emission reduction outcomes. Enabling collaboration. So climate change is the challenge of our time. This is quite clear. And what's also clear is action needs to happen at all levels, all countries, all sectors, all actors, Climate change cannot be beaten without collaboration. The Paris Agreement is fundamentally a commitment by all of the countries of the world to fight climate change and to work together. Uh, nationally determined contributions lay out what each country will bring to the fight. And Article 6 of the Paris Agreement lays out the basis for international collaboration on emission reductions. Now, people will ask about the Paris Agreement um when i'm talking about this sometimes and they'll say well somebody's dropped in or somebody's dropped out um this is fine this is the nature of a political beast but i continue to be buoyed and impressed um and brought hope by the fact that one december in paris all of the countries of the world got together and agreed to beat climate change so Back to Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, uh, a fundamental of this is really that there needs to be double entry bookkeeping to track emission reduction transfers from across borders. Um, so in the past with the clean development mechanism, there was really just a creation of a credit and that was moved over from the producing country to the purchasing country um, without the creation of a corresponding debit. 
However, now with all countries of the world essentially being part of the Paris Agreement, we need to have this uh, credit creation and moved, and then the, um, the marking of a corresponding debit. Uh, and this starts to get us towards why blockchain. So why blockchain's a fit? Um, this double entry bookkeeping that I was mentioned and is a fundamental of uh, accounting um, really is given a, a, a third dimension or a triple entry bookkeeping um, by the uh, marking of a timestamp um, when there is a transfer on the blockchain. Um, other aspects are really the um, tr transparency and verifiability aspects of a blockchain. Um, so when there is a transfer of an emission reduction outcome uh, or under Article 6, they're called ITMOs, Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcomes. When these move, um, you're able to see that movement from one account to the other on the blockchain. Uh, you're able to go and look and make sure that that happened and that that uh, account still owns that unit. Uh, and then you're also able to trace it back all the way to its genesis when it was issued and brought onto the blockchain. International collaboration goals will be supported by the transparency, accessibility, and usability aspects. So here at Blockchain for Climate, uh, our goal of building a tool to put the Paris Agreement on the blockchain or Article 6 on the blockchain, um, the transparency, accessibility, and usability are, are quite key. So there will be a system uh, built in some fashion, whether on the blockchain or off, whether by us or by, by someone else. Um, but the blockchain tool is helpful for that transparency, as we mentioned, um, where you're able to see all of the transfers. Uh, in our particular case, there was discussion before about the ability to see all the transactions or not. Uh, I'm of the fairly strong opinion that being able to see everything from the onboarding or uploading or issuance of an emission reduction onto the blockchain through all of its ownership and then off to its final use and retirement is absolutely appropriate and really manifests the sort of SDG um, around transparency and um, sorry, not SCG, the Article 13 through the blockchain. Accessibility is also very important to me. So with the blockchain platform that we're building, we want everybody with a smartphone to be able to fire up their, um, their browser, go look at an online platform and see uh, where all of, essentially, if they um, want to spend the time looking and as we organize a proper viewer for this, they can go look at transactions on the blockchain. They can see um, what their national government is doing in terms of transferring Article 6.2 units. Um, they can see if they're a project developer or maybe they have an investment in a project developer, if there's been a successful issuance event of credits and a transfer and a retirement of those. So accessibility is a big piece that I think we can drive with blockchain and really move and dem democratize uh, the engagement with Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Usability, sort of similar to what I just mentioned, but bringing it right down to owners of ITMOs, owners of these climate assets, and giving them a tool to be able to transfer a unit themselves, um, to make deals, to uh, have uh, much less friction in the exchange of these units so that they can do business, and that can gear up investment and we can have a fighting chance against beating climate change. So Blockchain for Climate Foundation is working to build a registry and exchange system uh, where there can be the registry and then transfer of emission reduction outcomes. We're building this in an open source fashion um, in public and because of the Ethereum blockchain, we're really benefiting from the thousands of developers that are engaged in this system. One of the key aspects of this, which we'll cover more later, but is important to note, is that rather than building on the main chain of Ethereum, um, we're building on a proof of authority side chain. And so some of the fundamentals that have been laid out previously in this call, or that you may understand about Ethereum, um, become different and some are still correct and some change. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but I do really like the, the fact that there are thousands of developers working on Ethereum right now, building tools um, that you, I could have certainly never imagined that pop up each day. And so we sort of have our, uh, our scope that we know about right now and the utility we can bring to that. And there also is the magic of new tools showing up in this fast moving space that we can use to refine this even further. 
people will ask, so why blockchain's a fit? People will ask, um, why don't you just keep this on a database? Why doesn't this just live on a spreadsheet or in a big mainframe database um, and you can reconcile the accounts and, and do all this work? Uh, and it really comes down to the, the nature of an ITMO or of a carbon credit um, as a intangible digital asset. So it is an asset that's created through creation and viewing of a, a real world action, whether that's installing renewable energy, uh, protecting a forest, um, capping a landfill and capturing the methane gas. Uh, that reality is then described through the standardization and certification process, which allows you through a standard to come out with a credit. Um, and notionally, that's an asset. Um, but the difference uh, with blockchain and not is um, with a database, um, it's just numbers. Carbon credits are just numbers on a database. But an ITMO, when loaded onto the blockchain, becomes a distinct, discrete asset. That tokenization event of taking something from off the blockchain and putting it on the blockchain um, is sort of this fundamental of creating a digital asset, which is digitally unique, um, which allows it to maintain its value and operate through these systems. Um, the other aspect is, is as all of the folks on this webinar um, and in this room continue to be successful in our work to move the Paris Agreement and the climate fight forward, um, it's my belief, and I think a fairly safe bet, that these assets will become some of the most sought after, valuable, and strategically important assets in the world. Um, and so it behooves us to um, build a system that's robust, but also transparent, accessible, and usable. The blockchain, so I'll just kind of whip through this, but it's it's nice to sort of touch on blockchain. I'm, I'm definitely not the best blockchain 101 um, because I've seen real masters deliver it. Um, uh, you know what, maybe I'll just let you look at this for a moment, um, but I think that it's largely been covered uh, in the previous sessions, so I'll just let it go um, from there. Um, one thing to note is our system on Ethereum it, proof of authority network uh, will actually be extremely low electric demand, sort of similar to proof of stake, maybe even lighter. So um, there is no need to be concerned about the emissions um, being caused by the implementation of the system on the blockchain. That's really confined to proof of work systems of which we are not. So our technology. Um, so, Blockchain for Climate Foundation is putting the Paris Agreement on the blockchain. And uh, a key aspect we haven't talked about yet is that we're using, or our current design structure is using non-fungible tokens um, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so we're utilizing ERC721, and then also onwards the tools really unlocked by Matt Lockyer's ERC998 crypto composables pathway. Um, if you hang on through the course of this whole project, or sort of the whole course of this whole webinar, um, there will be a question set, and then there will actually be a, a bonus time where you can get some crypto kitties and learn more about the distinct architecture of our project. Um, and uh, we'll get to actually work through some of these tools. Um, but we are building with the non-fungible tokens because we see that as the best way to have each token um, carry and embody all of the data that's included in a carbon offset. Um, so country, project, vintage, and so on and so forth. With a crypto composable, you can essentially pick it up um, off the ground or off the digital ground and view it and see all of these attributes right in the token. Um, and this is both important for the, the use of every single credit. It's also important for how we can um, uh, scale a system that includes you know tens of thousands or millions of different projects and inputs and separate issuance events of itmos the proof of authority algorithm is secured by all of the countries of the world um, and we'll touch back to the ethereum main chain for security so our concept for this um, proof of authority algorithm is that there will actually be uh, nodes held by every single national party, every single country um, party to the Paris Agreement, as well as by the UNFCCC and potentially other stakeholders. And those will secure the network and have an additional level of oversight to what's happening on the network. Um, we also feel that this is a way to sort of embody the ideals 
of the UN and of UNFCCC um, and, and build that trust amongst parties that they can trust the system to be utilized for really the running of Article 6.2 and 6.4 in particular. Um, we affectionately name our, um, our unit the BITMO, the Blockchain Internationally Transferred Mitigation Outcome, and uh, that uh, is, is our shorthand. It took me a long time to come up um, with that name, and then in discussion with Dirk Forrester, I said, what do you think we're calling it? And he said, well, the BITMO, um, but he's a very smart man. Um, so the BITMO um, and uh, the use of a crypto composable pathway allows for hierarchical issuance and stacking of the emission reductions data. So ERC-721 non-fungible tokens, of which CryptoKitties were the first use, um, they can only be moved one token at a time. So if you think about it, we're issuing these carbon credits um, as a token. If we just kept it strictly to 721, you could only move it one at a time. That clearly won't work. And so it was Matt Lockyer's creation of ERC-998 and the ability to stack these assets. And fundamentally, you could have one token own or hold a billion other tokens and move it in one transaction. Um, that allows us to, to make this work. Um, it also has interesting um, ramifications for the ability to create project tokens and have those projects uh, periodically verify, or sorry, periodically issue uh, new vintages or new issuances of BitMOs. Uh, we'll get into it a little bit later, so after all the presentations, and after the questions, uh, we'll get into some more of the structure of how we envision all of the credit data to be embodied. Um, but a high level is really country, project, vintage, unit, and transaction history. You get to see it right here. Um, so this is the more detailed um, layout um, of the BitMO token. Uh, and so people who are familiar with carbon offsets uh, or play in this game um, will be sort of familiar. You want to see the country of origin um, of that unit. You want to see the sectoral scope. Um, so the clean development mechanism uh, has a sectoral numbering scope, which allows us to put one number um, into the token to keep it data light uh, and still know which sector it's from. We'll have a project name and a project number. And so right now in our architecture, it's undetermined whether um, we'll do a name and a number. Alternately, you could have the token just carry the project number. Um, and then when you view it in the viewing software or in the viewing platform um, on the internet, uh, it would be able to populate it with that name. So depending on uh, how much data we're trying to squeeze in uh, and how light or heavy that makes our ultimate token. Vintage, of course, what year was this unit issued from the project? Uh, individual token number or ID. So every token will have its own unique ID. Um, and so that can always be tracked through that. Uh, and then a pointer to off-chain audit documents. So people who are involved in the blockchain space know very well that loading, that the blockchain is the, a really expensive place to hold data. Um, so you don't wanna have a lot of data because every time you move it, um, it's expensive and uses a lot of resources. Now, a little hat tip to the later presentation, um, under our proof of authority mechanism, gas costs or the native token that you need to be able to move these BITMOs will actually be free. Um, uh, and those, the resources to run the system will actually be backstopped by the authorized nodes. Um, so it won't uh, cost anything in gas or in transaction fees on the system to be able to be transferred, which makes gas limits less important and makes size less important, uh, but still fundally, fundamentally an important piece of the puzzle. An update from Katowice. So um, I know many of you are, are part of the UNFCCC process. We'll hear from people that are actually part of the UNFCCC Secretariat very shortly. Um, and COP24, so the more, most recent major UN climate conference was in Katowice, Poland uh, last December. Um, and uh, a big job at that COP was to write the Paris rule book. Um, and I put maybe somewhat glibly, um, Article 6 of the Paris rule book was punted. Um, I actually haven't updated this since they moved COP back from January to December, um, this particular slide. Um, but basically there was obstruction by a country um, that wanted to be allowed to 
to double count their emission reduction outcomes. Um, uh, I won't hammer on that, um, but uh, suffice to say that they have not completed the rule book or really the, um, all of the rules for how the short Article 6 of the Paris Agreement from 2015 will actually become a, a sort of a full-fledged functional tool. Um, and so that actually makes Blockchain for Climate Foundation's work that we're doing right now, and I've been doing over the last year and a bit, and will continue to do through this year, leading up to COP25, that much more important, um, because we're trying to run as fast as we can um, to reflect what is in the existing documents and what we expect may be in the future ones onto the blockchain. Uh, we do have a leg up on that because text negotiated before the close of COP24 and in the presidential proposal document put forward by Poland does give us a good idea of what negotiators might want to see in a rule book. Um, another key aspect is um, sort of there's an informal take um, that once the rule book is completed, uh, that that will actually then kick off another process to build. Um, the architecture for this registry and transaction, um, whether it happens on the blockchain or not. Um, so we are hopeful that we can provide helpful service to the whole system and to people who have ITMOs building up uh, and who have made investments um, that we can have our system to market quite early on and refine with whatever other late breaking news comes in the Paris rulebook um, so that, uh, that we can get up and going and making transfers across borders. And we are working on bringing a, a working prototype um, uh, to COP25 so that we can show that to national parties assembled there. We can show that to the UN process and hopefully get this um, inserted as part of um, upcoming rounds of, of COPs and subsidies. Building a solid foundation. So Blockchain for Climate Foundation is established as a not-for-profit um, society in Vancouver, British Columbia. We have teammates uh, in Vancouver, Toronto, Copenhagen, San Francisco, um, and we're very, very lucky to ha really have top-notch people from their different industries uh, who come around to help us build this tool, um, to bring the blockchain expertise, to build the climate expertise, product expertise, um, convening expertise, um, and so uh, a big shout out to the whole team. You can read more about us in the team and advisor section on blockchainforclimate.org. Um, in looking sort of at our roadmap, uh, we have three fundamental pieces of the puzzle. One is building out the technology, um, and so we have a portion of the team working on that. We're also gearing up our national party, UNFCCC, and multilateral engagement process. Um, we want to engage with parties who will be ultimate major users of the system um, to have them share with us, you know, what do they like about it? What do they not? Are there red flags that we're not seeing that they don't? As well, they're um, supporting um, expertise in their countries and at their academic institutions and in government and in civil society all bring invaluable knowledge of the existing state of play and what we need to um, put onto our system, and then what we want, might want to see for improvements into the future. Um, and then finally, funding and infrastructure. Um, we have a partnership project with Ecotrust Canada, um, uh, which is an enterprising not-for-profit charity based in Vancouver, Canada. We're rolling out some other country-specific lenses with them, uh, and they are very generously letting me spend a good portion of my time building this out, so that's much appreciated. Um, and uh, on that topic, um, if you have uh, resources or know people who do, who want to support the bringing of this vision to light and the bringing of this tool, please reach out to us. Um, and finally, we are judiciously growing our team in advisory. Um, so if you think you may have something to contribute to this, um, also feel free to reach out. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, once again, I'll be coming back in about an hour or so um, to walk through more details, show you some graphics of what we're building um, for our platform, and then we'll also have the opportunity um, for uh, you to receive a crypto kitty, which were really the, uh, the first implementations of the ERC721 non-fungible token. Um, so thank you very much, and do follow us at, at Block for Climate on Twitter, um, and feel free to reach out via these emails. Thank you.
Perfect. First of all, I'd like to say it is an absolute pleasure to be on this call. Thank you for everybody that has presented so far and very much looking forward to the others. Uh, it's also really exciting to see all the familiar names in that participation list, whether they're just uh, uh, familiar names, friends, uh, colleagues, former or past. It's, it's great to see everybody here. Um, as uh, Soren and Marco just mentioned, my name is Mark Johnson. Uh, I'm the Director of Labs and Technical Project Manager for Block, which stands for Blockchain Labs for Open Collaboration. And I'll be walking us through some of, uh, while not you know, specifically um, uh, focused on Article 6 or on UNF C um, endeavors, it is a real life application within the maritime sector. And then I will, uh, throughout the presentation, I'll drop a few little um, uh, tidbits about how we envision this being applied in other industries and the work that we're doing in other industries currently. So without further ado, uh, here's a quick rundown of what we'll be walking through. Just obviously a high level intro about uh, who we are and what we do. We'll talk about one of our primary subsidiaries, Maritime Blockchain Labs or MPL. Uh, we'll talk about um, uh, one of the early use cases that we identified within the maritime sector and why we have focused um, a lot of our efforts in the maritime sector. And that is that fuel contamination crisis that uh, you see there on 4.3. Um, then we'll dive right into our first um, demonstrator project and our first uh, application that we're moving into the commercialization stage. And then at the end, I've reserved a few, uh, just a few points uh, to discuss Article 6, the sustainable development mechanism, and uh, MRV processes, whether they're the existing ones or how we think we can utilize distributed ledgers to um, automate some of the processes related to the ongoing MRV efforts. Um, a lot of that I'll leave to a later time when we move into the discussion phase, but I will highlight a few key facts. So, moving on, uh, as I mentioned, blockchain, or block stands for Blockchain Labs for Open Collaboration, just a little cheeky little acronym there. And uh, we are a Copenhagen-based uh, consultancy and development studio that focuses on sustainable, resilient, and inclusive infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure specifically. Uh, as you can see here, here's a few key points about us. Um, uh, a mission, uh, as the name uh, uh, states, is to foster true collaboration um, and transform uh, global markets in an open fashion, if you will, uh, as the core value there alludes to as well. And oh, that's about it there on that slide. Um, we adhere to a very um, uh, conservative and or pragmatic uh, process or approach of designing um, our applications or sourcing our ideas for application development and it's always through a consortium led approach so we see the most value in utilizing distributed ledgers in bringing together a group of you know industry stakeholders uh, getting them all around a table discussing what some of the key problems may be um, that they all share um, uh, discussing what the uh, proposed or the um, sus suspected uh, solution to those problems may be. And we take this four step approach here, as you can see laid out, to uh, validating uh, that process and building an application. So we start at the, the early stage, the concept feasibility, and, you know, gather input from all the various um, uh, industry stakeholders for that connected value chain or for that industry that we're working with. Uh, and we really lay out the details. We say, okay, um, what are some of the problems you face? What are um, uh, the minute details associated with that? Uh, and then we move on to saying, okay, can we um, package all that information into a hypothesis and we can we... Um, develop a minimal viable prototype to kind of test out or validate those hypotheses. And then we go uh, to that third stage or that phase three here to um, building and scaling that technology. Uh, we'll talk about this later on uh, the marine fuel assurance application and where we stand with the scaling of that. Uh, and then later on, um, we move it into phase four, which is the ongoing operations and sustainment or maintenance associated with a enterprise grade uh, fully functional uh, commercialized application. So with that being said, here's a quick overview of our team. Uh, it is in, uh, I, I mean, I really can't state this enough. It's an amazing team. Um, I have been very fortunate to find a, a very unique mix of, uh, of very, very knowledgeable individuals. 
uh, and it has been an absolute thrill to be involved with uh, their business and their processes. Uh, as you can see here, some of these pictures are a little outdated for those of you that do know me. Uh, you can tell that this picture is from quite a few years ago, if you will. Um, but uh, just that's just a quick overview, as you can see from some of the information there. Uh, quite an extensive um, amount of um, uh, experience in various sectors and or various uh, industries in the past. So um, very small, agile, nimble team with a, that packs quite a punch, if you will. Uh, moving right along, we'll go through a quick intro of Maritime Blockchain Labs. As I mentioned, it is that subsidiary body that sits under the parent company of Block, and that is where a lot of our ongoing uh, research and development within the maritime sector exists or, or uh, currently is housed. So what is Block or Maritime Blockchain Labs? Um, it is this uh, underlying body that was um, uh, founded in uh, April of 2018. Um, with the help of initial grant funding from Lloyd's Register Foundation, a very large name in the maritime space, of course. And uh, the scope of Maritime Blockchain Labs, especially in collaboration with Lloyd's, is to um, uh, build three demonstrator projects for three specific use cases within the maritime sector. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing so in a consortium-led approach, um, bringing together the individual industry stakeholders, uh, discussing the problems that they all uh, share, um, validating why those, uh, why those uh, problems exist and trying uh, or attempting to alleviate those pain points or drive efficiency gains by uh, aligning the incentives and or the uh, operations of all those stakeholders throughout the connected value chain that is in question. Um, uh, this is just a little bit more about Maritime Blockchain Labs, our steering uh, committee and our ongoing operations, very much just a reiteration of some of the things I just mentioned. Uh, and here's our demonstrator pipeline. As I said, there's three of them. Uh, demo one is our marine fuel assurance product or application. I'll be uh, diving into that here in a few minutes. Uh, that began in January 2018. We spent the majority of 2018 um, focusing on that, you know, validating, once again, validating the uh, pain points and designing a solution that works for the industry. Um, as our, you know, consortium-led approach preludes, it is, we, everything we do is uh, built by the industry for the industry, and that is our modus operandi, day one, day 100, all, you know, through and through. And uh, we were very fortunate, actually in September, we completed the first end-to-end -end, um, uh, blockchain-based uh, delivery of fuel in the port of Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. And then shortly thereafter, we were fortunate enough to win the MIT Solve uh, Challenge for our work in the coastal community sector. Uh, and actually next week, a few of us will be back up there at MIT again this year discussing our ongoing efforts and our work um, in that space as well as some of the other spaces. Uh, moving on to Demonstrator 2, we have worked uh, in a number, another uh, very interesting area within the maritime space. Uh, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, my primary background has been uh, largely focused in the energy and the finance space. So before, say, seven months ago when I formally joined the team, I had very little understanding about the, uh, the ongoing or the, the minute details associated with the problems in the maritime space. But it has been an absolute uh, thrill to learn about them. And one of those areas that I did not know much about was the cruise certificate area. It is a, uh, an incredible incredibly complex and incredibly fragmented um, uh, market or subset of processes that exist within the maritime sector. And the individual seafarers that board vessels on a day-to-day -day basis, they have to manage a pretty hefty book of paper-based certifications to ensure that they are compliant for uh, operating or working on a seafaring vessel. And uh, time and time again, when we've been working with these seafarers, they have stated that those documents, those paper-based documents that they have to trudge around the world with each other or all the time, they, they value those you know, more than gold. Without any of those individual papers, they will, will be out of a job. So we have developed a blockchain-based uh, document management tool to enable them and all the other individual stakeholders to better manage um, those crew, crew certificates. And then our demonstrator three, which is kicking off very shortly, literally next week, um, is about um, bringing the individual industry stakeholders together in designing a more efficient process and or application to alleviate the problems associated with the declaration and shipment of dangerous goods, uh, which is another huge problem within the maritime sector. 
And uh, while I don't have time to go into it now, it, it's uh, throughout our research, early stage research, at least at this point, we have uh, unearthed quite a, a tremendous amount of information related to um, the fact that uh, the misdeclaration of dangerous goods is one of the primary reasons for, um, for uh, onboard fires and or uh, adverse implications arising on seafaring vessels um, when shipping you know, our goods around the world. So that's just a quick overview of those three main demonstrators. Um, outside of, well, I'll, I'll take that in a second. Um, here again is just talking about our inclusive governance framework. We have a number of people at the uh, advisory committee level uh, that make up you know, our founding uh, members and or our steering committee to help guide uh, what the demonstrators may be. And then we take a, a unique mix of industry stakeholders in each of the consortium. So, if you're familiar with the maritime industry, I'm sure you'll be familiar with a number of the names listed here. These are uh, some of the largest people in the, um, uh, in the industry itself. And uh, I can tell you uh, now, while I can't divulge the names, that uh, for demonstrator three, the pending slide there, you, you will soon hear about uh, a number of large names also joining that one. Um, uh, this is more information about what we were just talking about, the ongoing status and progress of the various demonstrators. Demo one, we fully um, built out the application. As I mentioned last year, we were fortunate enough to win the MIT Solve Challenge for our ongoing work. And as I'll talk about later, there are uh, a number of ongoing operations related to the scaling and productization and commercialization of that product. Uh, demo two, we are currently in the stages of uh, showcasing our um, prototype now that we have built over the course of the last several months. And then demonstrated three, as I mentioned, is literally kicking off next week. Um, once again, quick little timeline of all the various events that have occurred. It's been a it's been a uh, a jam packed year year and a half or so, uh, and uh, we don't expect it to slow down anytime soon. So, just a quick overview, going back to the first demonstrator project uh, and where we sourced this idea um, in the marine industry or the maritime industry. There was a uh, quite a substantial um, crisis that occurred over the. Uh, spring or summer months of 2018, and that is largely reg regarded as the marine contamination crisis or the summer of contamination. And while I know this is very text heavy, the next few slides are primarily for individuals to uh, take a look at it later at a later stage when we hand over these documents. But the gist of this is that there were um, uh, some contaminants in the um, uh, fuel blends originating from a few ports around the world. Uh, the fuel, or excuse me, the, the primary contaminants were lubricants used um, or epoxy resins used for um, uh, various additive measures, but uh, they caused some serious engine malfun malfunctions and or damages. And uh, the, the maritime industry is very unique in that fuel is um, uh, reused and reblended a number of times through um, vessels and or through various um, um, uh, seafaring vessels, yeah, that's the appropriate word. And uh, what is not used on one vessel or may be transferred to another vessel and things like that. So uh, it's very difficult to keep track of all of the, uh, the history, if you will, of the fuel that is used by a vessel or through it that comes through a port at any given time. So here's just a little bit uh, more of information about the uh, scope of the problem and some of the reasons why this problem existed. Um, here is just to give you a little snapshot of the extent of the problem, uh, which originally um, started with, um, uh, I would say, I believe it was 10 or 12 uh, vessels originating in the port of Houston. At least that is what the prevailing uh, thought is. It's very difficult, as I mentioned, to really hone in on the origination of the problem or the provenance of the problem, but um, um, it is uh, largely regarded that the issues uh, started in the port of Houston in Texas, United States, and what was about uh, 10 to 12 vessels quickly um, uh, grew into about 50 vessels out of Houston, and then that quickly spread to other uh, ports around the world. And by the time it became a real industry problem, it was you know 200 to 300 ships around the world. And in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the costs associated with engine failures, the cost of um, being non-compliant for insurance policies, the cost of uh, foregone revenue for um, uh, having to furlough some ships and things like that. Uh, it, this was uh, quite a shock to uh, the maritime industry, to say the least. 
So uh, it's very interesting because we knew about this problem before the actual contamination occurred, and so did you know majority of industry stakeholders. However, the the summer of contamination uh, just happened to occur as we were in the early stages of designing this um, this application itself. So uh, here is an intro of our first uh, application, which is which was originally regarded as the marine fuel assurance application. We've now um, uh, make that name a little less complex and are naming it Bunker Trace. So from here out, on out, I may refer to it as Bunker Trace, but uh, if there is confusion, please feel free to uh, question me on it at a later time. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, it's a highly complex and or uh, fragmented value chain that um, uh, comprises a number of individual stakeholders. Um, so we decided to create a uh, or based on our understanding of the issue, we decided to make uh, uh, an inclusive support system that enhances the traceability um, of the marine fuels themselves, or at least of the quality um, uh, metrics associated with the fuels themselves, so that as the uh, physical fuel is being moved through the connected value chain of the various industry stakeholders, that we have a clear, or that all of those stakeholders have a clear picture of the interactions that are occurring, and that they're is a, um, uh, a mechanism to trace back when a, an issue about the quality metrics may have or, you know, uh, come about. So here's just a quick snapshot of some of the industry stakeholders or some of the, um, the key stakeholders uh, in this connected value chain. We have multiple fuel suppliers, one, two, and three there, uh, bringing fuel to a port terminal. This is literally you know, right, right on uh, beautiful beaches, or not beautiful beaches, but uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the coast of many countries, of course. And this is where the fuel is blended from the various suppliers, then transported to a barge, and then ultimately to a seafaring vessel. There are a number of interactions that occur there, and there are a number of instances, not only for um, um, disputes to arise, but also for malicious actions and or fraud to take place. It is uh, very well understood within the maritime sector that um, uh, malicious actors have come in time and time again and scraped off, say, 1% of the total fuel that is being delivered. And while that may not make a difference, you know, in the terms of the total volume that is being transported on a day-to-day -day basis in and out of a fuel or to a vessel, um, because these are such large vessels, what that 1% actually translates into is hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's quite a nice little... Um, um, you know, <laughs> Monday afternoon paycheck for some of the uh, individuals involved. And obviously that has adverse implications to the ongoing operations of all the individual stakeholders involved. So we uh, worked to build, we worked with our demonstrator partners, as you can see here, um, to build this application. And we got uh, uh, prominent industry stakeholders that um, fulfill the roles of many of the uh, relevant stakeholder category groups associated with this connected value chain to uh, work with us on an iterative and ongoing basis throughout this application development. Six month process, very intense process of working with them literally on a day to day basis to better understand their pain points and what they think makes the most sense in a uh, very transparent and communicative manner to design the appropriate solution to safeguard or alleviate uh, many of the specific pain points. So uh, as you can tell, here's just a quick little uh, value prop of how, what we think we have designed and the value that, um, that is created from this application. So uh, by um, uh, what, what we have done is create an application that um, records all the various quality metrics associated with the, uh, uh, the ongoing, I guess you could say, movement of a physical fuel delivery throughout the connected value chain. And at each uh, point of the interaction between the connected uh, or between the industry stakeholders, whether it be the suppliers to the terminals, uh, the terminals to the individual barges, the barges to the seafaring vessels, uh, at the point of interaction between those two, these uh, quality fuel metrics are recorded uh, and then obviously translate to a foundational data layer, a, a distributed ledger based system uh, to ensure that once recorded that there is no, um, that it serves as that single source of truth and that if there are any um, uh, quality disputes at a later date down that connected value chain, that we can look back at the history of transactions or of interactions and see where that dispute may have arose. 
So by doing this, it provides this end-to-end -end chain of custody for fuel, fuel supplier, or excuse me, from fuel suppliers all the way down the value chain to the, to the vessel operators that records all these quality metrics. Um, what this does is uh, provides uh, quite a, a substantial tool, or at least based on the feedback that we've received from real life customers and or from our consortium members, uh, it, it uh, enables um, quite, a, quite a substantial amount of value by providing a decision support tool for the bunkering operators, and it acts as a regulatory compliance and insurance compliance tool um, that provides a, uh, uh, a new level of traceability and or of integrity associated with the physical delivery of bunkering fuels that has not existed within the industry before. And um, just to really reiterate that point, here are some of the large, um, uh, how should I say, some of the large regulatory and or Here's a screenshot of our current build. It's hyperledger fabric. We have done so uh, at the early stages uh, in a permission fashion, obviously, to ensure that we get the um, the primary stakeholders and the primary um, uh, primary stakeholders aligned, and that we get the primary uh, permissions aligned and everything like that before we open it up into a more open and, and inclusive system, which is obviously the end goal. Hence, our our name. Um, key findings, we are running some uh, scaling pilots over the summer with uh, a number of industry stakeholders to uh, align this and, uh, and build it out to a more commercialized product. Um, bringing this back all to Article 6, SDM, MRV, things like that. Uh, we believe that utilizing distributed ledgers in this bottom-up fashion with a consortium-led approach with various industry stakeholders is uh, an appropriate approach to um, utilizing frontier technologies in a bottom-up way that enables, guides, and or um, uh, helps develop these top-down regulatory uh, guidelines or frameworks. And specifically regarded to Article 6, you know, obviously the main thing that we're talking about is the international transaction log that currently exists under the CDM and the Kyoto pro protocols. And if we're going to design a new system, I mean, as it stands now, uh, based on my understanding of the current system, the international transaction log is highly efficient process with a number of double checks and a number of um, uh, the appropriate uh, data exchange standards, as you can see here, in place to ensure that operations uh, uh, occur efficiently. And if we really want to uh, create a more robust uh, mechanism, specifically a distributed ledger based one, then we should look at ways to work around the periphery, this dotted blue line, uh, to interact with all the other industry stakeholders in various industries that are not specifically nation states or parties to the UNFCCC, but are also very relevant to um, uh, enabling or the full implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, with that shameless plug, here are some more of our work. Um, Bunker Spot Magazine um, just re released a very thorough overview of how we are, what we are doing and how it's uh, and tackling some of the problems in the maritime sector. Um, very um, thorough paper that I wrote on linking various carbon markets and uh, IRENA publications for uh, distributed renewable energy resources. So uh, by all means, take a look at that. Once again, I apologize for going over and uh, appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for this interesting uh, presentation here. We have a, a number of questions on the chat also to your presentation. And if there's time at the very end, we may come back to some of those issues and uh, cool. start discussing further on, on, uh, on those relevant stuff. So with that, I would like to move uh, one further uh, in our line of presentations here. And I welcome Rachel and Susan from the World Bank Group, uh, who will be talking about the World Bank's uh, blockchain activities uh, and position. Um, Hi, um, I'm really sorry, but um, my computer doesn't have a camera um, integrated, so I might not be able to share my um, webcam, but I hope you can see my slides. All fine. We can see your slides, all and fine. I can also see Susan, so, uh, so uh, you're all on. Go ahead. Thanks. Great. Perfect. So, um, hi, thanks for having us today. My name is Rachel, and I'm from the World Bank Carbon Markets and Innovation Practice. I come from more of a policy perspective and our work focuses on piloting different activities to support Article 6 and um, we work very closely with the IT Technology and Innovation Lab to look at how emerging technologies including blockchain can help support climate markets. 
So I think my section will be quite brief, just giving you an overview of our overall work program, but most of it will be Susan uh, to demonstrate how the pilot actually looks like in practice. So I think I might even just go very briefly here, but I think most of us here recognize the benefits of carbon markets. Um, we have a flagship report called the State and Trends of Carbon Markets, and we estimated through that report that um, international markets could substantially lower the cost of implementing NDCs um, around uh, reducing the cost by a third in 2030 and half by 2050. And it could mobilize resources as well from both public and private capital, which is another uh, opportunity that uh, we are exploring. And a lot of uh, countries have indicated in their NDCs that they would be interested in implementing carbon pricing in markets as well. So in terms of our work program, uh, we focus on four components to support Article 6. The first part is how can we initiate the supply? And with this work, we focus on MDB operations and piloting existing internationally recognized or market great methodologies to um, generate um, mitigation outcomes. And the reason for focusing on MDB operations is so that we could benefit from the existing due diligence and lower the project risk. Um, and then these mitigation outcomes that are generated, we envision could be stored in what we call a warehouse. And I'll go into a bit more detail about this in the next slide, but essentially it's a transparent inventory um, of available mitigation outcomes that allows buyers to transparently track and compare different assets from a wide range of mechanisms. And then the third component is um, transactions. So here we're working with um, more than 10 private companies and AITA to see what new financial instruments could be designed to help lower the risk of market engagement and help increase the demand for mitigation outcomes. And then the final component is an overarching component where we're using a lot of analytical work, working with um, a range of Article 6 negotiators um, to see what is required to inform the regulatory framework for Article 6. So this slide here just gives more of an um, overview of what the warehouse could look like. Um, we normally describe the warehouse could maybe look a little bit like Amazon.com in the sense that Amazon stores uh, products from a range of suppliers, but they don't necessarily own the products that are being sold. So in that context, the warehouse is essentially a one-stop shop that allows different market mechanisms to store their mitigation outcomes. And we think this is quite important um, given that uh, we will have a range of market mechanisms, especially in the context of Article 6.2, and the opportunity for more bilateral or plurilateral collaboration. So um, in this context, we think this concept's important, and we, um, while the World Bank may not necessarily own such a architecture, we do think this is a concept that's worth further exploring. So in this diagram here, we see that there are assets from a range of different um, countries, and the idea is that the warehouse would mirror um, some of these existing mitigation outcomes from existing registries, or it could even act as a registry potentially for countries that don't have a registry yet. Um, so we're working with a blockchain lab to see whether um, blockchain technology could be used to help design this warehouse. And a key feature of the warehouse is that uh, we would like to include a range of filters um, to help the buyer filter through uh, different assets based on their preferences. And one of the major features is that we envision that um, climate assets that are in entering the warehouse could go through an independent assessment using a tool that we've developed called the Mitigation Action Assessment Protocol, the MAP tool. 
So the MAP tool is essentially a tool that tries to enhance the comparability of um, increasingly diverse assets across different mechanisms. And it essentially assesses the risk and performance of different actions based on different modules, like um, the design of the program, uh, the financial structure, the management entity, and the sustainable development benefits. And um, this slide just shows um, the, the progress we've done so far with the warehouse. So we are currently working with Susan and other IT colleagues to um, define what are the requirements for the warehouse. Um, and we hope to do this, um, complete this by the mid this year. And we're also uh, working with the blockchain lab in um, working on a prototype specifically on how emerging technologies can be used to inform the functionalities of the warehouse. And we hope to launch this and showcase this by COP25 with our partners at the government of Chile. And beyond the warehouse work, we've actually done a number of other uh, reports and piloting on blockchain. Um, so we published a report last year um, on the uh, what are the high-level opportunities and challenges of blockchain for post-2020 climate markets. So you can download this at the Open Knowledge Repository of the World Bank. And as I mentioned, Susan will tell you a bit more about the proof of concept that we're working on. We're also working with a range of um, experts uh, through the Climate Chain Coalition to see what are the um, external experts' thoughts on how this proof of concept can continue to be developed. We've also contributed to the Climate Ledger Initiative report that was published at COP24, and we have an ongoing pilot with the government of Chile as well. So I think I'm going to stop here. That was just a really quick overview of our program, and I'll hand over to Susan um, to give us a demonstration of what the prototype actually looks like in practice. So um, a little bit about our lab. Uh, we sit in the IT department of the World Bank, and we work with clients to help them understand what emerging technologies can do and what the capabilities are. Um, this slide, I'm not going to go into too much because I think probably a lot of you are already familiar with it, but for the carbon climate markets areas, we tried to look at what are the problems that we're trying to resolve and what can these different technologies do for it. And so from the blockchain piece, looking at the double counting, double spend problem and can we use it to increase participation? Um, how can we use it as sort of an infrastructure to build rails to bring different solutions together? Um, we also did some experimentation with IoT in looking at how it can resolve the first mile problem of trying to ensure the integrity of data coming into the blockchain. So this has been a criticism that our lab has, has heard from multiple clients of, okay, that's great, as you have everything in the blockchain, but how do you know that the data that you've put in there is actually uh, good data going in? So we were trying to use IoT to look at that piece of the problem. And then from AI, um, being able to look at those different outliers and ensure that the data going in is sort of what you're expecting to see. And um, that, that's the main reason that we've, we've looked into AI a little bit at this point, but we know that there will be more uses later on. We try to emphasize that these are components. They're building blocks from IT systems. They need to be combined with other technologies as well. Um, and so the blockchain isn't going to resolve everything. When we look at the entire space of what uh, Rachel's team is trying to do, uh, we've divided it into six different components. Uh, so one of these we did last year, at the end of last year, which was looking at purchase agreements, commitments, and transactions, settlement, and payment by setting up just country to country trading. So trying to demonstrate the, the, how can blockchain resolve the double spend, double count problem? How does this look? How does it work? Just to try to make it more real. And then we've started um, also experimenting around these other areas as well. So for the first area, the experiment that we did last year, we tried to base how do you get assets into the system based on current processes because there's a familiarity to it and to even show how blockchain could be used to show that these processes are taking place and the flow of these processes that one goes into the other and adding some transparency into it 
so we wanted to show how a purchase agreement could be used to, in the current system of donor trust fund um, finance projects going into the blockchain, the issuance of carbon assets. Hypothetically, who could potentially verify those assets to ensure their quality? And then also, then the, these being transferred into the accounts of the appropriate countries. Then we set up a system where countries could buy and sell those assets back and forth to each other. This piece here did not include the payment piece. So in looking at payments, we realized we could do that part on the blockchain or we could leave that off chain and um, use sort of a holding area for assets to go until payments have been received. So we did that and put in even a, a dispute mechanism just in case the assets, the money wasn't received so assets wouldn't be transferred uh, within the system that we built. And then we just did some simple screens to show how this would work. This first one, just looking at the whole process flow, how you could see all of the different transactions that happened between participants. And then we wanted to show how country to country trading could look and how you could trace the assets from uh, one buyer to seller and so forth on and on through the system. This year, we started looking at this first mile problem and in integrity of assets. And so we put together a simple uh, experiment within our lab and simulated a solar implementation uh, using basically products that we've had from our, our kids' school experiments. So uh, we used a Raspberry Pi as the IoT um, device. We purchased a sensor uh, to measure the outputs of our solar panel. And then what we wanted to do was investigate the, heart, the architecture. What is needed to ensure that this can scale? What is needed to ensure that it stays reasonable as far as price goes? And so we went through multiple iterations and decided um, that our storage should be blob storage. And then we looked at, well, what should we actually be putting on the blockchain piece? And we decided the blockchain part would be an aggregate of the readings that are coming off of the panels and then hash to the blockchain. And why are we doing that? So that if you're starting the MRV process, you could download that data, hash it, compare it to the hash on the blockchain to ensure that the data hasn't been tampered with. And then from that point on, you know that you can do an MRV process. We know that this will also have implications on the process itself because the readings could be near real time. So instead of waiting until you have a certain number of assets to start a very expensive process, we hope that by showing how you can do near real time readings of these and ensure a little bit of integrity into the type of information that's going on, then maybe this process will change. Maybe it will become cheaper and the assets could be in smaller packages going into registries and eventually being sold. Then we started working on the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and then, what we also did was we built a um, very simple UI uh, so that you could actually view the hashes. So if we took this particular project, which is, is just uh, an example project, just to show that it's in the system and then a link to actually view the hash information and then download the information available from it. And just to bring it to more of the real time or the reality piece of this is that, as Rachel mentioned, we've been working advising the Chilean government on a similar project. So each time we do one of these experiments, we've been sharing the knowledge with them so they can incorporate it into their solutions as well. And so this is a project where they're taking the readings from government buildings and putting that information to a blockchain uh, and then eventually into their registry. In looking at the warehouse concept, we see this as an aggregation of a lot of these experiments together. How do we bring all of these pieces in? Um, how do we ensure a uh, variety of participants? And then also investments that people have already made in their own systems, which we also think is important. There are markets out there that are functioning. There are existing registries. We want to improve and we want to preserve those investments that have already been made. And so we tried to put together an architecture where we could bring all of these pieces together. And so our thought on this is that if there are pieces that governments already have or regions, how, do, how can we be as flexible as possible 
as far as bringing all of these uh, actors together and all of these different systems in one place. So the dark circles that you see in this architecture diagram are the nodes of our system. So our idea is that the warehouse would encompass the metadata, the very high level information that might be needed to be able to compare assets, to bring buyers and sellers together and define the information that's needed. And then each system would connect to their own node the way they feel uh, makes sense for them. Uh, we also looked at interregional uh, markets just to, and, and registry systems to see where, where would the ideal connection there be. And if you don't have a system that you necessarily want to connect, you could just connect into the user interface to see, um, go directly into the system to take a look at what's going on. This is just another view of it, just looking at what are the different types of actors that would connect via an API. And then of course there'd need to be a, a governance system over the entire thing to ensure um, who has access to it and to make it as inclusive as possible. We built out a very simple user interface for it to show using, using some projects that were readily available on public registries to show how it could look, how the filtering could look. And the point we were trying to make with this one was that, you know, even though there's blockchain in the background, the front end could look like any other application. Uh, we can make it user friendly so that people can find what it is that they're looking for. And the main point of this was to, even for the data elements that we have, how do we make this as flexible as possible so that when we move to other types of assets besides CO2 equivalents, that the registry is able to handle those. Um, the comparability aspect that uh, Rachel mentioned, that's another area where we thought there might even be, be different types of benchmarking tools in the future enabling participants to choose those tools as they move forward and to expand out the functionality of this. And that's it. Thank uh, you very you. much, uh, Susan. That was uh, really insightful. Thanks. And, and on top of it, you're fully in time. So that's highly appreciated also. Great. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, and with that, I would like to move on to our uh, last uh, presenter of today, which would be Masamba Toy from UNFCCC. Uh, now, I understand that, Masamba, I hope you're on, but uh, that uh, you do not have a slide set, but just will give your presentation as is. Masamba, I'll, I'll drop out and uh, you have 10 minutes and we're very much looking forward to your, your comments and your, your view on these issues here. Thank you very much. Perfect. So I will share with you the work that we are doing on the application of DLT ecosystem. Um, to enhance climate action. So the first thing we have done uh, internally was to explore uh, to what extent uh, DLT is really um, an enabler, is uh, important for uh, the enhancement of, of climate action. So we develop um, a decision tree to identify uh, what are the attributes and the characteristics of um, DLT that could uh, add value and which type of value addition we could expect from this uh, characteristic and how they could actually um, improve um, the impact of, of climate action. So we come to the conclusion that there are areas where DLT are really enabler, meaning in the absence of the DLT ecosystem what they allow to do wouldn't be possible. And there are areas where they actually uh, enhance efficiency, meaning this can be done uh, with other solution than DLT ecosystem, but using DLT ecosystem will definitely increase the efficiency and area where let's say it's nice to, to have, but it does not really um, increase very much efficiency. Um, so, and you can see that the focus here is really on DLT ecosystem because we realize that for all this application, DLT alone uh, will not address the issue, but it has to be combined with other uh, digital technology such as uh, IoT, uh, smart contract, 
uh, and, and artificial intelligence. So where we realize that um, um, DLT ecosystem will really be an enabler, meaning that in its absence, we will not be able to address the issue we want to address is uh, in the area of scope three, climate contribution, the, the measurement and, and attribution of scope three climate contribution. <laughs> so what is it about? One of the specificity of the situation, let's say um, post Paris, is the fact that we would like to have um, a broad range of climate actor from all region and all sector. So unlike in the situation of uh, Kyoto where the focus for climate action was only corporate post Paris, we would like not only corporate to climate act, but also we would like the stakeholder of the corporate to exercise their influencing power to uh, change the um, investment behavior of the corporate. So it means that we are expecting financial shareholder of a corporate to use their influencing power and, and make their investee organization change their investment plan. We are also expecting customer um, of uh, the product coming from the, the corporate to exercise their influence as well as suppliers. So, and if you want to um, incentivize this stakeholder of a corporate so that they, they act, you need first to be able to measure their climate contribution. So the measurement of climate contribution of the stakeholder of a corporate is a very important issue moving forward, but very complex uh, for several reasons. Uh, the, the first is the fact that it is very difficult to establish causation between the action that is actually um, undertaken at the stakeholder of the corporate side. For example, if I take the case of a financial, the action will be taken by, for example, a shareholder. But the impact we are looking at will take place at the economic level, meaning um, in the form of GHG emission reduction at the corporate level. So the link between, for example, um, a, a, a shareholder conducting shareholder engagement and the impact in terms of GHG emission reduction in the investment plan of the, of the company um, is not obvious. And because there is no causation, there was a need to come up with some alternative uh, solution. And what we are proposing here is the use of the theory of change, where blockchain will play a key role in the sense that um, it's the immutability, the immutability of data uh, would be, for example, one of the uh, key um, aspects that that would be uh, that would be used. So um, another important aspect is because we have several stakeholders around uh, a corporate, the issue of attribution of climate contribution without double counting will be a very important problem because we may have several influence exercise on the same. Uh, corporate, and you may have several stakeholders claiming the same impact in terms of GHG emission reduction. So how do you attribute um, this uh, GHG emission reduction to the different stakeholders? There, also, there are several attributes of uh, blockchain uh, and DLT ecosystem in general that um, could, could help. So another concrete example is um, if you take uh, the case of a supplier of solar panel, um, um, it could be a startup putting effort in decreasing the price of solar panel and enhancing their efficiency. So if this startup managed to have solar panels that are enough cheap and enough uh, efficient so that the electricity they produce is let's say cheaper than the electricity based on fossil fuel, um, the user of this solar panel in the current, let's say, framework 
The user of the solar panel, the IPP that is using this solar panel to produce electricity, would be the only one recognized as climate actor. And actually, its contribution is actually inexistent. He just bought solar panels that are enough efficient and at sufficient lower cost so that it's economically better than using fossil fuel. But our current framework is not able to measure the contribution of the startup who actually make things possible. And our current framework cannot incentivize the startup who actually produce this um, uh, solar panel. So now we want to move to a new framework that will be able to recognize, recognize the contribution of this startup and also incentivize um, its action. The same uh, happen when you are in a supply chain. Very often it happens that some climate action undertaken upstream will only materialize in the form of GSG emission reduction further downstream in another company. So there also um, uh, having DLT ecosystem will help establish the link between the action that is undertaken in company A and the impact that materialize only later on in, in, in company B. Um, the, to, to incentivize the development of uh, climate uh, technology, here again, you will need to be able to incentivize R&D and demonstration that will only materialize in the form of GHG emission reduction uh, later on. So these are areas where for us, it's really important to explore how this DLT ecosystem uh, can, can help. Now, there are many other areas where they are um, providing value addition in the form of enhanced efficiency or uh, more cost effectiveness. And it includes all these issues related to the tracking of unit, the trading of, uh, of, of unit. And one, one important application also we are looking at very closely is um, uh, the fact that it can empower individual citizens so that they conduct climate action and be uh, recognized. So for example, we are working with the energy web uh, to, 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 um, uh, to pilot test the situation where individual buyers, we as UNFCCC buyer of electricity, we could actually uh, get our electricity from, from a very specific uh, power plant that is generating uh, renewable electricity. So we are also looking at means to incentivize, for example, individual uh, women in a rural area of developing countries using, um, using advanced cook stove, um, and that could be actually incentivized automatically they, they use the cook stove and they start getting their credit or, 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 or money. All these things could be uh, realized with this uh, new DLT uh, ecosystem. So some of these things are under, let's say, uh, development. We have, for example, one project uh, on, on, the, on the development of um, uh, wood, sustainable wood for construction where we are trying to measure the climate contribution of a supply chain. And, and, and their uh, DLT ecosystem uh, is, will be also used. So this is part of the project. So I will stop there um, and uh, happy to contribute to the discussion. Thank you very much, Masamba. It's, it's a pleasure <coughs> that you are on here. Uh, and with that, we have, uh, uh, well, 25 minutes approximately of time for, for discussions first. Uh, and I believe that the best thing to do is we'll pick up on some of the questions which came up in the chat during the different presentations, and then we'll take, uh, uh, let the discussion roll from there. And, and uh, let me start with the, uh, with the first question coming from Stan. I'm not quoting 
where it comes from, I'm more touching upon the general topic of, of the questions coming up and then we'll take it from there. So one thing was about uh, what you would call the last mile issue, uh, basically the question of the data integrity or quality of data entering towards uh, the, uh, the blockchain. And uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I probably everyone here presenting something could add to that, but uh, maybe we would like to start with, uh, with uh, Joseph and maybe Mark would also uh, like to chip in uh, if possible, but just go ahead. Great, absolutely, thank you. Um, so this is of course something that any self-respecting blockchain project developer would be addressing in a way, it would be addressing um, with platform. Um, what we are doing is because it's really interesting, we're kind of building a decentralized system on top of a, a very centralized system with decentralized parts. That doesn't make much sense, but um, there are two streams for incoming um, ITMOs or in, uh, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes into our system. One is through Article 6.2 and the other one is through Article 6.4. In 6.4, um, the process is quite straightforward because we would be oracle or ingesting data um, provided by whatever takes the place of the CDM executive board. So there will be create, uh, completed carbon offsets that will be uh, moved from database and then issued as a BITMO and transferred into our system. Um, so we are relying on um, all of the other existing due diligence and hard work around the creation of a carbon credit um, using the rules laid out by the UNFCCC um, and the clean development mechanism and whatever the successor to that is. Um, so we'll be in taking top quality data. Um, over time, we're excited for all these other projects um, that are using IoT and using other systems uh, that will ingest data um, through sensors um, that I'm sure will be also be able to included, be included in the generation of offsets. In Article 6.2, it's a little bit more complex um, because due to the bottom-up nature of the article, um, every single national party has the option to, to do it their own way to a certain extent, to issue um, ITMOs off of their national carbon inventory. Uh, and so we'll be working on systems and are working with Ecotrust Canada, for example, uh, on a system to be able to intake that country-specific data and onboard it onto our system. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, I don't know, Mark or Susan, anyone else want to contribute to that issue? Uh, I am thrilled that this is the first question that we're kicking it off with because this is, uh, at least in my opinion, one of the more um, pertinent questions. How do we ensure that the data that we are bringing into these uh, distributed ledger systems is uh, secure, that it is ver verifiable in some form or fashion? And, uh, uh, and how do we safeguard against uh, this garbage in, garbage out situation? Um, so what those types of mechanisms and or protocols are widely referred to, at least in the, in the DLT space, are called crypto anchoring mechanisms uh, to ensure that whatever is happening in the physical world is accurately represented in the digital world as well. And um, I will, while not getting too much into the weeds of the maritime space, as I unfortunately did earlier, I will briefly talk about what we're doing for the use case in the marine fuel assurance. Uh, and then I'll also talk about one of our use cases in the energy space. So for the marine fuel assurance space, we have actually partnered with a company that is uh, utilizing synthetic DNA tagging that uh, on a molecular level, literally a one to one billion uh, scale level, they are tagging the physical fuel itself. And then we are recording the unique identifiers of those individual tags so that at any point in the, um, the delivery and or use of the physical fuel itself, we have um, uh, ver or provably verifiable sources of reference to showcase where that specific blend or that specific fuel type came into the mix or into the connected value chain. So by doing that on the physical level and then recording the human interactions that occur via the digital application that we built and bridging the gap between those two, we have um, securely uh, um, or mitigated against the um, possibilities of fraud and or malicious actions taking place in between the physical and the digital realms. Uh, secondly, just a quick use case. I didn't get to talk about it, but we have recently launched an energy project in conjunction with IKEA's research and design lab. Uh, this is a 
um, microgrid configuration. Um, it currently is housed in Space 10's, uh, that's the IKEA's research and design lab, Space 10's um, awesome little uh, um, office in the Meatpacking District of Copenhagen. If anybody is around and wants to go check it out, it's really, it's an amazing little one to 50 scale model. Um, and the underlying transaction network is once again based on Hyperledger Fabric and we are utilizing sensors uh, as some of the other individuals mentioned earlier. Um, primary use cases for sensors in these types of situations are the Raspberry Pi devices. However, we went with the Odroid 2 device because we think that it has a significantly le higher level of uh, security and or functionality associated with it. Uh, and through the federated network that we have set up um, by providing uh, different levels of uh, permissions and or access to uh, access rights to the individual uh, Odroid devices that are housed in the, at the individual house level, we are securing that last mile interaction between the actual uh, distributed ledger and the physical um, solar panels that are housed on the, um, on the houses themselves. We uh, more than likely will be showcasing uh, this project, which is called Solarville at Event Horizon, which is Energy Web Foundation's large uh, summit in June, as well as um, uh, potentially running a pilot sometime in Q4 of uh, 2019, excuse me. Um, so once again, I think that those crypto uh, anchoring mechanisms are incredibly important. There's a number of ways to do it, but it is primarily about the, the sensors and or the physical tags within, embedded within the system and making sure that you transfer what's occurring in the physical world to the digital world. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, and Mark, I'm saying this, if, if, uh, uh, if you can keep it short, I would have an initial question to you, uh, which not is my own question, but I captured from the chat, chat again, uh, because uh, during your presentation, there came up the question is, what could be learned from the shipping industry for the climate-related applications, uh, which we are interested here primarily? Uh, and I think there is something about the, the, the whole process of that you've maybe been a little bit further out there rolling out a prototype already. There may be something about the adoption and the, your experiences from that which may be relevant in our context. Uh, or, or could you comment on that too? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, there, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. There's a lot to bite off in that, um, uh, especially if we want to loop in some of the uh, aspects that Masama brought up with Scope 3, because we do believe that utilizing these frontier technologies uh, in, in employing them or utilizing them as the foundational data layer in industries where there are a number of stakeholders uh, associated with the connected value chain, that um, uh, serves as uh, a very, very uh, great source of accumulated data inputs to then um, uh, create enhanced insights and or analytics associated with processes that then leads to tracking various emission sources or embedded emissions in connected value chains. Uh, however, in terms of um, the second part of the question from, say, some of our learnings throughout this process, um, while we, we believe there's a tremendous amount of value to be had by utilizing distributed ledgers in the appropriate context, uh, unfortunately, as I think you all know, there are the, the ecosystem or the industry as it exists right now is ripe with misuses of, um, uh, of distributed ledgers. Uh, as Masamba also appropriately mentioned, the, uh, the decision tree, and as uh, Laura, I believe you mentioned earlier, decision trees as to whether or not a DLT is an appropriate uh, tool to utilize in a use case and which type of DLT is the appropriate use case or uh, appropriate technology to use in a use case is incredibly, incredibly important and should be uh, questions, those questions should be asked on a repetitive basis throughout the application development. Um, and I'll just leave it for there for now. <laughs> And you know, Mark, thank you very much. And you leave it at the exact perfect point uh, because it kind of leads to my next question, uh, which uh, basically is about that we heard from Laura here some kind of conceptual considerations uh, along the decision trees. How, what are relevant design parameters in the blockchain, and how could it fit to the challenges posed in the uh, Paris Agreement, Article Six? And then we hear from you, Joseph, kind of a, a concrete solution, suggestion for a concrete solution. But what are then the overlaps uh, between your conceptual considerations and, and your kind of uh, uh, concrete solutions? I think you two could chip in. And as we're sitting in this cozy place here, I mean, you're just, uh, go ahead. 
Well, okay, I can start. I assume I also have to keep it short. Um, Please. <laughs> I try on that. So I think um, let's start for, perhaps with the similarities to make friendship and then find the dissimilarities. I, I assume like one similarity is that we both assume a somehow permission system. In your case, you presented proof of authority. I know I didn't have a look directly at that, but with hyperledger fabric and then um, you could say a more um, permissioned uh, protocol with proof of stake, depending how Ethereum will implement it. Um, this is like one key similarity. On the other hand, perhaps one dissimilarity is that um, um, I presented different token types so that you can have fungible and non-fungible tokens. And in my opinion, it would be better to represent ITMOs as fungible tokens and store information as meter information of a token to make it easier for each party to um, transact these tokens and do not have to handle kind of multiple currencies and perhaps even with currencies to make this lab there. I personally even think that it private system as Hyperledger Fabric has the huge advantage that it will only have the currencies defined upon it. So my fear a little bit with a public system like Ethereum is that then you have the Ether, then you might have um, other currencies involved, other tokens involved, and it might be not trackable, but go ahead. Right. So there will be one, so there will be a transaction thing that represents gas on our on our proof of authority network mm -hmm. but there will only be one currency and that will mm -hmm. be the bitmo and they're all represented by one ton of emission reduction outcome so there's only one type of of unit okay. that is a unit of measurement on our system um, the proof of authority pathway is fascinating um, chain safe systems out of toronto is doing a lot of leading work on that they've built the girly test net um, and uh, are really uh, paving the way on that and I think that part of that is is seeing uh, limitations within the main chain of Ethereum mm -hmm. and so uh, it allows us to really tailor and I think sort of mix some of those aspects between the the, the commonly understood and, and studyable systems that you were working on um, the uh, Oh yeah, I think the other aspect is, and what's so exciting about this is there are hundreds of different blockchains oh. um, and uh, thousands of different use cases uh, and teams of bright people all over the world. And so I think that um, especially until there is a designation um, by a, an authority with the authority to really move things and move the course of history, um, that it's great that people are, are iterating, iterating and choosing a pathway that they see works. Um, so we've taken a look at what needs to get done, our understanding as present of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, um, and have a fair bit of nuance in, in that outlook, and then also really bright, like, bright uh, genius blockchain people, and we're, we're doing our, our task to bring those two together and say, all right, with what exists out there and with the ethos that we want to follow, what's the right thing to build? Um, and so it's a very exciting path, and I know a lot of people are on that path, uh, and, and so power to you all. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in from the rest um, to this issue. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, one thing in my view that is very important is to separate between the attribute and characteristic of the DLG ecosystem and then the value addition that is expected by the user. Um, one of the problem we, we see is there is a lot of mismatch between these this two. So for example, when I'm talking about value addition by the user, I mean uh, enhanced transparency while ensuring privacy. It could be immutability, the fact that you have a timestamp, um, trustability, resistance to failure, uh, trust minimizing, and uh, reliable data storage. All these things are specifications that are at the side of the user. But now, what are the specificity of the DLT ecosystem that will allow to achieve this, uh, let's say, element of the user TOR, it could be the fact that the system is distributed and decentralized. It could be that the system is ensure cryptographically sealed data. 
It is an append-only data store. It is a consensus building tools, and, and you can control your audience. So I think having this separation will allow, based on what is it that you want to achieve, to design the right DLT um, ecosystem that will be suitable for your uh, specific utilization. Okay, thank you very much. And to some extent, I could say what you just mentioned, Samber, is, is leading maybe to my to my next question, uh, a little bit uh, to the question of that. Well, we we may be in a in a concept stage, and we move towards proof of concept. But uh, if we really want to move further on, there must be some kind of you know user adaption. Uh, there must be a perspective towards someone really rolling it out broader. Uh, and, and I think it would be interesting here now as probably the last question we could, uh, we could discuss, what would be kind of the central drivers or barriers towards coming beyond proof of concept? Maybe? Uh, is that, uh, uh, maybe Joseph, you, would you chip in on that or is it, yeah? Yeah, and I'll really, um, so for our system to be fully functional, um, we are, we're building that proof of concept. Uh, we'll bring it to COP25 um, and we hope to engage with uh, the proper parties and in this next half year leading up to that uh, and then allow people to play with it as a proof of concept into trial wallets. Um, uh, but then eventually we want to engage um, national parties uh, to try it out bilaterally. Um, and see if we can't just make it work um, within that system. And then in our ideal world, uh, we would insert it into the negotiation processes uh, of the COP um, and have it be adopted uh, by the system as the tool for transfers, either the loan one um, or, or one of a number of them. And, uh, and then people could use it then. Uh, in five minutes after the end of our Q&A, uh, I'm gonna do, we have another half hour um, where we're gonna give away some crypto kitties and almost as importantly, dig into the architecture of the system that we're building. And we'll point out the spots where there are accounts that are held just by national parties um, and the UNFCCC, and then the situation where wallets can be held by anybody who wants one or who wants to create one, uh, and then they can own um, the units that are appropriate to be owned um, by private actors. Uh, and so in that case, um, then there would be the ability to, um, to transfer and trade tokens, to acquire tokens and use it. Um, but uh, other than the proof of concept, it will be a little bit of a while before you can do that. Maybe to get back to, um, to Søren's question and what Joseph already indicated, um, I think in order that we reach a blockchain adoption is that we need to engage the, the people that are actually using it out in the world, which will be the parties of the Paris Agreement. So I think it is about designing an MVP and as many pilot projects as possible in order to have something to showcase and make blockchain more tangible than it is right now. And then just um, ask people what they, what, what they want, what, what do the parties feel confident using um, and develop it further in the co-creative approach. Because um, in the end, if we're just sitting at our, our um, laptops and, and coming up with the best theoretical system, we won't get anywhere. And I think that's also why it is so important to get um, to the stages to interact at COP, to present something and then get the feedback from the parties that are uh, actually going or need to adopt it at some point and who need to be the driver of the decentralized and bottom-up Paris Agreement. And also great to get everybody's feedback today on the Zoom group chat um, or through whatever communi communication method further on. Um, and we'll also be, and I, I know a lot of people, um, all of the different parties who are speaking today and other people engaged in this space are getting out to the conferences, are getting out, we're gonna speak at Innovate for Climate. Um, I know World Bank is as well. Um, and so people will be getting out there and just really great to engage. Um, and nice to have webinars like this where we can bring together participants to explore this and, and let us know what you would need in a, as a user. Thank you. This uh, sounds already like a closing remark by Joseph, which is, uh, uh, I think there was some, yeah. which, which we are moving oh, towards too, <laughs> but I would like to give all the others uh, uh, who presented also the opportunity to come with uh, a very brief statement if you, if you like uh, to close this off. Uh, uh, and then, uh, but we don't really close it because as, 
Joseph just mentioned, stay on for another half an hour and we'll explore together the possibilities also around CryptoKitties. But uh, go around. If uh, Any other comments you want to make at the final end here? Yeah, uh, Masamba, um, uh, I just would like to provide uh, one, one, one advice. I think moving from proof of concept to adoption under the UNFCCC process could be uh, extremely uh, unlikely and, 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 and difficult because you know that uh, parties will need to have clarity about how the system function and it's not an, an, an easy process. So I think what could be very useful is in parallel to engaging with party for them to understand what is the value addition of this uh, uh, disruptive technology for uh, the UNFCCC process. It will be good also to engage with non-party stakeholders and try to have the non-party stakeholders adopting this technology and start using it. And this will, if, it, if they successfully use it at, at scale, then this will provide confidence to parties for the adoption. That is so much true. Thank you very much. Uh, further comments at the very end here? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chip in just for a second. Uh, just agreeing with the other points that have been made here. I mean, I think that mass adoption, uh, if that's the term that we want to roll with, will occur as value is demonstrated. And when utilizing distributed ledger systems, value is demonstrated and or created by working with industry stakeholders to, um, uh, to align incentives and or alleviate pain points and drive efficiency gains. So the more that we can do this, and that's why we employ the consortium led approach, the more that we can do this by taking the relevant stakeholders together and really uh, diving into the details of the, uh, the question at hand, the, uh, the higher chance of long-term value creation that any of these projects have. Thank you, Mark. So when we're talking about uh, adoption and trying to scale these technologies, uh, a couple of the points that we've come across all parties need to be incentivized to use it. There can't be winners and losers. There needs to be people who are going to gain something from, from participating. U user interface is extremely important. This needs to be simple. Uh, we make things too complicated currently. It doesn't inspire trust in the system. So we need to get better at making this technology accessible to others. Governance model that inspires some confidence. Uh, you're building out a decentralized system. How centralized is your governance model and is that necessary? Are we overdoing governance? Uh, how, do, how do we ensure that this network that we're spending money and time in and investing in is going to be sustainable and that there's going to be a group of people or actors or participants that are going to keep it, uh, keep it going? And then I think also just trying to de-risk the changes in the technology as well. So we're building these systems. How coupled do we, are we putting these systems together? Um, are they going to crash at some point if the technology evolves too quickly? Um, so I think trying to uh, build people's confidence that we can handle the fact that the technology is evolving and changing and being able to incorporate those changes into solutions. Thank you very much. Anyone else uh, on the line here? No, I think I was. Yeah. I think that was, that was a, a covered very well. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, I would like to remind that we will have recorded this whole webinar and we will publish that webinar on YouTube. And if you follow us on our social medias or look on uh, our home pages, uh, you will be able to watch those, uh, the, the webinar again. Uh, uh, or dig deeper into individual topics here. So thank you very much. I won't go through the whole lineup of brilliant presenters and presentations today. It was a pleasure having you all on board. Uh, I think we got a step further in this whole discussion. It's only one step. There will come new, numerous uh, additional steps in, in this way. But I think we're embarking on a very interesting journey. So thank you very much to everybody. And stay on to... Uh, Let's get rocked with some crypto kitties, uh, right. uh, Joseph. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. We're now, I guess we're two and a half hours in. And so this is epic. 
Uh, really appreciate your your focus and engagement in the space. Um, we kind of we feel the same way. So I'm going to talk about the an architecture summary of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation platform um, plus CryptoKitties. So the Blockchain for Climate Foundation, um, if you've heard the earlier part of my presentation, we're putting the Paris Agreement on the blockchain, connecting the national carbon accounts of the world to enable cross-border collaboration in emission reductions. We seek to build an open source public solution on the Ethereum blockchain to improve transparency, access, and utility. And we fundamentally believe that blockchain technology uh, enables optimal development and implementation of a system that enables and facilitates effective global greenhouse gas emissions mitigation efforts in accordance with the Paris Agreement. So for you lucky folks that are still on the webinar, um, we have almost enough crypto kitties to give away to every single person. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna give you a little flag um, for what to do to get set up with this. And then I'll talk more about the architecture. And then a few minutes after that, uh, we'll start sending away some crypto kitties. So, um, later in my presentation, we'll do a little interactive exercise to explore non-fungible tokens via their first implementer, CryptoKitties, um, done out of Dapper Labs in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, it was quite an amazing time to be around, uh, to be uh, significantly down the blockchain rabbit hole, um, and to see CryptoKitties show up. Um, uh, now, if you... Um, and, and the reason why we're going to do this and why we want to just send out some crypto kitties, of course, it's a very basic function to execute. Um, but what I found getting involved in crypto kitties was it really pulled me sort of down that rabbit hole. It pulled me into experiencing the feelings of having a cryptocurrency, of buying ether and then send it, spending it on these kitties. Um, how do you set up a wallet? How do you set up a MetaMask? Um, and so hopefully today, a few more individuals are able to um, to take some of these steps and 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 catch uh, catch the virus, as they say, because the virus is spreading. Um, so, if you paste your Ethereum public address into the webinar chat box, um, we will send you a crypto kitty. So you can go ahead and start doing that right now. Now you've got about 15 minutes before we start sending those out, so you've got a little while. Um, if you don't already have an Ethereum wallet. You can set up a mobile wallet. There's lots of different ways, but we found that Trust Wallet at www.trustwallet.com um, is a good one that includes the ability to view your non-fungible tokens live in your wallet. Um, so you can download it onto um, Android devices and Apple devices there. Now, if you're working off your desktop, um, you can get pretty amazing functionality um, with MetaMask. If you don't already have this, you can go start setting it up via uh, metamask.io and work through that process. Um, you will need a little bit of ether in your account, I believe, to receive these. Um, so uh, we've got uh, Cam Fung of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation uh, is on the line, um, is, is on the chat as well. Uh, and uh, he will be the one that will be sending you the crypto kitties. Um, if you don't have any ether in your wallet, if you're setting up a new one, uh, we can send you um, a, a little bit of ether dust um, to make sure that you're able to receive that uh, transaction. Um, you can also go look at CryptoKitties.co um, with your MetaMask open. Now, um, so I guess you'll need to do that if you're using your desktop. Um, and once you do that, you'll be able to uh, MetaMask open, CryptoKitties.co on your browser, and then you'll be able to see the whole CryptoKitties setup, and you'll also be able to see when you receive your CryptoKitty um, from the Blockchain for Climate Foundation. So, um, don't hopefully you don't get so involved in that that you can't uh, absorb a little bit of our information about the architecture, though I would completely uh, understand if you did, um, but excited to get more in depth into what we're building um, at, uh, at the Blockchain uh, for Climate Foundation. Um, and you won't need my address. Um, uh, I'm getting a question. Yeah. Where do I find my public address I have to send to you in the uh, endpoint I just downloaded it? Mm -hmm. um, so the question was where, if you're just downloading a wallet, where do you find your public address? Um, 
I, I don't know the systems well enough to be able to walk you through, but if you go and look for the public address, there will often be, a, there's a public and a private. You shouldn't send us the private address unless you really want to, but then we would be, one would be able to drain your account. So don't do that. Just find the public one um, and then paste it in. That's a very good point. So on to um, the Paris Agreement and Article 6. So as we discussed, um, Article 6, uh, it's a really profound part of the Paris Agreement because it fundamentally allows cross-border collaboration in emission reductions. Uh, it's the way that uh, countries are able to mint emission reduction outcomes um, and uh, pivoting off of their national carbon inventory and then send those abroad. Um, in a similar fashion, it's the way that people can issue carbon offsets or Article 6.4 units and transfer those. 6.2, we, we, it's called bilateral or country to country cooperation. It enables external investment either at the national government level, um, at the national government level. So it enables one to support countries, whether richer or poorer, to make emission reductions somewhere in their national carbon inventory. And so I think this is the key. Um, we want a transfer pathway um, so that country A, for example, could support country B um, with um, additional overseas development uh, um, money, uh, funds. Now, we don't want it to replace the existing stuff, but if we're, countries were to up their level of uh, assistance and tailor aspects of that, tailor some of those funds to achieving a clean energy transition or protecting uh, and, and restoring landscapes, um, that there actually is a way for the creation of a unit um, based on the outcomes of those investments to create an ITMO and have those transferred back to country A, the, ho the donor country's account, um, and allow that country A to go beyond their existing investments uh, and find a pathway to, to send more money. One of the things that I will note um, is that there are realities behind the Paris Agreement uh, that are negotiated by consensus, which is so found uh, fundamentally amazing, um, that uh, are perfect in my mind. There's other ones uh, or in other people's minds that are not quite perfect. Um, our job as the create as the builder of a blockchain platform um, to operationalize Article Six uh, is that we need to do the best with what we have available, uh, and then make our system supportive of of the outcomes that are going to be the best for the climate and for users. Article Six Point Four: um, Project-Based Sustainable Development Mechanism. So this pathway en enables external private sector investment in projects anywhere in the world. Um, so where 6.2 is more investments um, and investments into a country and non-project based issuance of outcomes, um, Article 6.4 is, if you're familiar with carbon offsets, it really follows that similar pathway. Now what's important um, is that it allows uh, offsets that would be being made today or in the future uh, to become Paris compliant and hence usable for, towards meeting nationally determined contributions. That does really underpin the work that we're doing at Blockchain for Climate Foundation. Um, we're trying to work really at that, uh, that point, that axle of um, transferring emission reduction outcomes and having them be taken off of one national account and eventually put back on to the national account where they're being used and retired. Uh, and this is why we feel that this is a fairly unique tool that we're building and why it's really important to connect all of the other systems um, to enable these actions to be Paris compliant. Um, and uh, broadly, Article 6.4 allows that investment in the highest value and lowest carbon cost projects wherever they occur instead of in one's own country or fence line. So this is important. Um, my understanding is, is that right now there can be emission reduction outcomes made either in a national inventory uh, or by a project, um, but that they are, they cannot be transferred across borders um, in a Paris compliant fashion until 
um, until the registry and exchange and clearing function is built. Now that may, um, the build process may continue on the international transaction log. Uh, that build process may be the one that we're doing here at Blockchain for Climate Foundation. Uh, maybe there will be a syncing and meshing of those. Um, but fundamentally, that's what, that's what we're on about, and that's why we're working as hard and as fast as we can to get this enabled so as the Paris rulebook is cleared and people can start theoretically issuing ITMOs, that there is a way to trade them in a Paris-compliant manner. Blockchain for Climate Foundation architecture theory. So our aim is to take the available UNFCCC instructions rules and insights around Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So we're taking the data being created by consensus um, by all the countries in the world. Then our task is to manifest those on the blockchain, put really simply, and then reinsert uh, the platform back in to the UNFCCC process as an official tool of the Paris Agreement. Yes, this is audacious. Um, but it's no more audacious than trying to insert ourselves into the official negotiation process without a product. And it's no more audacious than all of us here trying to save the world. So I think it's a great use of time and, uh, and all that. And Masamba did make a really good point um, that there may be interim steps where uh, once we do have the beginning of trading, once some national parties are engaged and are able to insert Paris compliant ITMOs into the system, then there can be a buy sell trade um, a process um, where people are able to move those and see that that works, which can hopefully pull more people in. So that was a very good point and I appreciate that. So uh, the architecture, we've actually talked about uh, the proof of authority bit. I wanted to dig more into that because um, for people who know the Ethereum blockchain well and who may have um, opinions on it, um, the, the, the proof of authority architecture really is different than how one would normally understand, even with an excellent understanding of Ethereum. Um, one of the fundamentals is, is that there is a fair amount of leeway um, for the creation, in the creation of a proof of authority sidechain, um, where the, the creator of that um, can call the shots on what's being created. So one fundamental aspect um, was that rather than in Ethereum where there is gas, uh, or gas costs to move every token, um, there still will need to be the use of resources, um, which are tied back to the, the expense it takes to run the nodes that run the system. Um, those costs will be borne by the proof of authority nodes, um, and we'll need to iron out those details um, of funding in the future. But the key part is, is that it won't cost users of the system anything to make transfers. Um, because the, the gas that we'll be creating on this, or that is the analog to gas, will be free. Um, this is sort of part of our broader goal to um, be able to eliminate rent-seeking um, pieces of the puzzle. Um, we'll be able to do some of that within the scope of what we're doing, and as things move out, I think it's really important that you know we limit um, the rent-seeking and the sort of pulling out of, of money meant for addressing climate change, um, into other systems because we've got a lot of work to do and it, it needs all the resources uh, getting to the ground level as much as possible to actually create these emission reduction outcomes. With the proof of authority, we did see a really nice energetic sort of um, story, not storytelling, um, well, it's a storytelling, it's, it's um, aspect where we want to offer every single country in the world the ability to host a node and secure the network, um, as well as other players in the system. We sort of imagine UNFCCC, potentially World Bank and other M, uh, M multilateral development banks, uh, and in the future, maybe more parties. Um, but that vision of inclusion, trust, and engagement, and having everybody be engaged is so part of the UN and of the UNFCCC, and we want it to be part of our system too. One of the key aspects for people who are more familiar with proof of authority um, is that we do want our side chain to be connecting back to the main chain of Ethereum periodically. Um, and so this is really important because it allows an extra level of security um, so that conceptually, um, if there was corruption within the proof of authority network, um, the maximum damage that could happen would be any transactions that happened in between um, the most recent and the previous 
um, check back into the main chain. Um, so this is something that our developers are working on, um, but uh, once again, it's really important for uh, the design when we're fundamentally building the most important asset class, probably both in terms of dollars, as well as um, uh, tools for addressing climate change into this system. So the token architecture, um, and uh, we'll have a neat um, uh, exploration of CryptoKitties in a little bit. Um, and in CryptoKitties, they, they have different traits that manifest in the visual picture of your CryptoKitty. Um, and so we kind of think of these different pieces of the token architecture as somewhat analogous to this. Um, so if you're involved in carbon offsets or in the system, you'll know that there's certain data that needs to accompany a carbon credit. Uh, there's the country of origin. This is both important for record keeping and for searchability if people want to buy units from certain countries. Uh, it is also part of the tool that will allow the removal of the ton of emission reductions from a national carbon inventory and it's embedding in the ITMO or in the BITMO. Um, so this is a, a key aspect of what our system does. Uh, sectoral scope, as I mentioned before, it's based on the CDM numbering. Um, this will allow people to know what type of activity caused this benefit um, and uh, we get into a little bit about our viewer infrastructure and how people, um, any users of the system, will be able to go in and examine individual BitMOs um, on our blockchain, uh, as well as visualize the status of different national carbon accounts and other wallet holders of, of BitMOs. Um, and so a real world use case of this is if people are wanting to secure um, to buy a thousand BitMOs um, and they really want to get something from the global south, um, they want to get it from forest carbon, um, then when they're searching and they're sort of number one and two architecture pieces, they can enter this in and then see the tokens that are that represent to those. Um, a, a, a brief touching on money and how people buy and sell and trade and contract for these BitMOs. At present, the system we're building um, has the registry and exchange or transfer process built in, but it doesn't have the process for actually buying credits. Um, and so we see this as a role both for existing um, exchange providers and potentially other players who want to engage in building a system either based on fiat or theoretically based on crypto um, where those purchases can be made. Um, and so that's out of the scope of our pilot for right now, um, but is something that can be built in the future. Um, we don't want to hold, we'll allow other ingress, other people to, um, to feed into that through an API um, and engage with wallets to be able to make those transfers. Um, and if you wanna talk about that more in the future, I'd be very happy to do so. So next set, um, project name, that's pretty straightforward. Project number, um, so this could uh, join or replace project name if necessary um, for the size of the system, um, but it allows the ability to um, always track that project. And then vintage, so each project will be able to issue credits for as long as their validation period is um, intact. Um, and so that will be carried in there. And also if you wanted to um, just buy tons from the last three years, you'd be able to put that in your search and, and purchase demands. Um, each token will have an individual token number or ID um, so that um, it is a sort of a sequential issuing of those. Um, and finally, uh, the pointer to off-chain audit documents. Now, um, there's all sorts of extra data that come along with the carbon offset um, and uh, those are um, necessary for you to understand that offset because it's difficult to embed that onto the um, the blockchain or into the BitMO. Um, we're going to have a pointer to those off-chain documents. Uh, I think it's likely that those would be held at a centralized repository, repository like the UNFCCC, um, and there will be a technical task to make sure that those links don't break. Um, but this is sort of part of the development path. Um, system functions, these are just the different things that are actually highlighted, I believe, in the uh, Polish presidency proposal for what um, a system will need to do. Uh, 
whichever one gets implemented. So you can sort of work through there. Um, and we're using this as a guide and also as a check back to what do we need to build into the system. Um, actually, there was one other piece that I wanted to talk about in the architecture briefly, which is we will probably build another field where there can also be pointers to other systems, to other compliance or voluntary systems. Uh, so it is likely that um, some aspect of all projects will have to go through uh, an itmatization process, to quote Katie Sullivan, the managing director of International Emissions Trading, Trading Association. So their credits will need to be turned into ITMOs, um, which involves that taking off and then putting back onto national carbon inventories. Um, and so we do see the, we want to create the ability to link into other systems and to other players building on-chain and off-chain tools um, where we don't have to completely recreate the wheel and we can port on these voluntary or compliance credits um, because national systems or other systems may be set up to use um, credits, some of which may not even have to have be hypnotized. They may not need to be part of Article 6 um, because they may just happen subnationally and those will all spool up into a national carbon inventory every year, um, or they may want to ensure that you can only use um, itmatized units for your compliance because the country needs to be retiring and using those. Um, viewer architecture. Um, so along with these tokens, we want to be able to view what's going on and a dashboard to view the wallets and the global state of accounts. So this viewer will be online and off chain um, and it will just view the data that is on chain. Um, it'll be able to be used to view individual token details uh, and then also um, to be able to look at the status of national carbon inventories um, and uh, and as tons are pulled off and tons are reinserted. Um, and uh, it's similar in function to etherscan.io, which I'll show you a screenshot of in a minute. Um, this is the minute. Um, so we haven't uh, got our system live on the blockchain yet, um, but as you're looking at this, you sort of see rank could be rank. Address would be the address of the wallet um, that was held by the national party or by a user. Um, and uh, you could also have, that talks about the, the name of that account, Wrapped Ether Binance. Uh, you could have the national, you would have the national country, the national country name there. Um, you could have your balance for how many tons are held. Uh, it's interesting looking at percentages and transaction count. Um, that may or may not be necessary. Um, but you can sort of think of this as how you would view all of the countries. Um, that is, it's basically reading the blockchain and showing it to you in, in user readable information. Um, now, uh, we're getting into the crypto kitties part of things. So if you haven't um, sent your public uh, key for your Ethereum address, um, Ethereum wallet, please do so now. Um, and Kem, actually, why don't you start sending people um, their crypto kitties uh, if there's some, some names in the box there. So looking at this crypto kitty, um, I think it's adorable. Um, and um, it's the blockchain for climate kitty. So in this case, we have the ability to name, change the name of the kitty um, over to um, whatever we want. Um, so you can think about that naming um, as maybe that's where you would have a project name. So what I'm trying to show you here is an individual. You can think of the crypto kitty and this display as a, the Bitmo. Um, and so you could have an image from your project. Um, you could have the name of your project, I think would be quite likely. Um, there's a little bit of discourse. So I did not write these um, things about top of the morning to you, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually one of the fun quirks of the crypto kitties where they have a little bit about themselves, a little bit of their bio. Um, but when we build up the Bitmo system, this is a spot where you could have a small discussion about what's this project all about. Um, and then you could have a, um, the hatch by it could be who generated that Bitmo um, and when that was created or the vintage. Um, Catributes in, in the CryptoKitty space, these are the different, the eight different genetic um, underlayers for what you see in that picture of a crypto kitty. Um, so there's a highlight color, the mouth shape. So this one's impish with its two little buck teeth there. Um, 
eye shape is wily, so it's kind of got wide eyes. There's some other really crazy eyes out there. There's fur type, there's pattern, there's eye color, there's the color of the screen behind it. Um, in this case, we see um, this be where we have the country, the project, the sector, and these type of details. So uh, you'll be able to see all of these surface in the viewer of, um, of your Bitmo. Um, and so hopefully, um, and it may uh, progress past the end of the hour, which is coming up shortly, um, but we'll get CryptoKitties to anybody who puts their um, wallet address in there um, uh, and hope you have some fun with that. And that's really, um, that's really the end of my presentation about the architecture. Um, and um, just looking at my notes, um, we're really excited to be building this. Uh, once again, the heart of what we're doing here and what we see as the killer use case for blockchain vis-a-vis -vis climate is actually being able to move units from national carbon account to national carbon account um, because that is what underpins Article 6 uh, and the integrity of the system. So we're exciting to be contributing to the transparency, um, to the usability, to the clarity, and also to the excitement around this system. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you all participants um, in this webinar and have a great day.